pop count, and that's then where stuff really gets a little bit complicated. So the question is, how can we detect if an anonymous page is shared or exclusive? Uh, we could do that. We could take a look at the map count and the swap count under page log, see if it's one. That was the traditional approach, uh, which was problematic. Or you can just take a look at the ref count uh, and say, well, if there is more than one reference, clearly somebody else is doing something with, with the page. So it might, it might no longer be exclusive. And it would all make sense and it would all work unless there wouldn't be get user pages. And uh, for those of you that don't know what get user pages is, it's essentially a mechanism to traverse the page table of a process and look up a page that's mapped and just like grab a reference on that page and return it to the user. It's for example, used for our direct, uh, P-Tray success, um, VFA or RDMA, IOU ring, it's all over the place and it's getting more more popular, so to say. And um, the various flavors and special cases we have doesn't necessarily make it any easier to understand. So for example, we have something called full gap, which means, well, I just want to grab the metadata of this page, but not uh, read or write page content, which is not used that way in the kernel, but that's a different story that has to be figured out. Uh, but then we also have full pin, which means like I really want to pin this page to, for example, read or write memory, let's say via odirect. Uh, we have full write, which just means, yeah, I have the intention of modifying the page versus I only want to read the page. And uh, what gets really ugly is, uh, for example, full force. Full force means like I have an unprotected range uh, in my process address space that I am, for, for instance, not allowed to write to. But with full force, you can bypass that and just say, yeah, well, I'm a debugger. I still want to write a breakpoint into whatever read-only mapped um, um, VMA, so I'm allowed to do that, and um, yeah, obviously just random code in the kernel can use full force with, with some not so good side side effects. We have group, group fast, uh, which is really nasty uh, in my opinion. It traverses page tables and looks looks up pages without taking any locks. So we have to be really careful when we unmap something or, or when we do certain operations on our page tables that. Um, Whatever we, like a, a group fast finds that it's actually consistent with what uh, a page table still have mapped. So just to give you some idea of like what are the issues that we're fighting with when we combine copy and write, especially of um, anonymous memory and um, get user pages. So this is the traditional approach where we want to detect exclusivity by uh, taking a look at a map count and a swap count. And this is the CV that has been reported in 2020 by Jan Horn. Um, essentially, you don't have to understand it in full detail, but what we have is we have a parent that has some anonymous memory. It uh, issues forks, so it shares this memory with the child process. Uh, and what a child does it is it uses get user pages to take a read-only pin on that memory, and it unmaps the page, so it no longer has access to this page content via its page table, but still via the... the the pin on that page. And after that point, if the parent modifies its own memory, you actually leak these modifications into your child process because the child process can just use, in this example, beam splice to still read that page via a um, pin that has been obtained via, via get user pages. So that already indicates like looking at the number of page table mappings might not be what we actually want. And uh, simplification and fix for it was well, let's use page count equals one. And how this can go wrong in, in subtle ways is a, a very rough example here. You also have to understand all of the details. But essentially what we do is we have some anonymous memory with some data and we register it as an IOU ring fixed buffer, which in turn results in IOU ring pinning that page. So IOU ring now has a long-term pin on that page, so it expects like all modifications being done to that page to actually uh, be visible uh, to that page um, via IOU ring. So in case we modify our um, memory now via our page tables, we would detect, oh, well, there's more than one reference. Um, for example, if the page accidentally got mapped read-only in the meantime, which can happen for various reasons, we would replace the page in our page table and whatever um, the um, IOU ring obtained, like this pin is no longer referencing the same page as our page table. So if you would write out uh, in this example via IOU ring, the page content to a file, the file content would not match what's actually in the process page tables right now. So uh, 
to throw in some more mysterious counters, uh, we do have a pin count. Um, pin count tells us, well, how often has get user pages actually pinned this page using this magic for pin flag. Uh, and one interesting side note is that uh, it's only available for multi-page folios. So if you have a single base page, uh, it's not available. And um, in contrast to the documentation, it can be speculatively raised by good fast. So that means not even in that case, it's, uh, it's correct to rely on the value. Um, so we do have a primitive that's called folio, maybe DMA pinned, and it even applies like to these large folios that it's only um, guaranteed to not have false uh, negatives, but it can have false positives. Now you might wonder, but well, like if we have a single base page, with, which is just like if we don't have transparent huge pages and all of that, like how are we able to figure out if a page may be pinned uh, by group? And uh, actually, we don't have a dedicated counter we, uh, because bits and the metadata and the struct page are rare. So um, smart people decided, and that, that's not a joke, to, uh, to mangle it into the ref count, which is actually a pretty, pretty neat idea, I think. And um, in, in case your ref count of a page is more than 1,024 uh, of an ordinary base page, you would say, oh, yeah, this, this page might be pinned, um, but I'm not so sure, and I'm not able to find that out. Now, uh, the, the message of all of these mysterious counters here is, like, how, so how are we even supposed to make any copy and write decision based on these yeah, uh, my mysterious counters? And uh, the answer is that maybe we really shouldn't, and that's where then... Um, the solution that we now have on anonymous memory comes into play, which is called page and an exclusive. I'm only gonna like describe the rough idea of what's happening without all of the dirty detail, but you can think of page and an exclusive as kind of a flag for a page that tells us, is this page exclusive or has is it maybe shared? Um, Essentially, the, the, the rules are fairly simple, although the implementation is a little bit involved. So whenever you have a new anonymous page, let's say you have a new process, it writes into an anonymous VMA that's private. You allocate a fresh anonymous page, and that will be exclusive because it hasn't been shared. Um, and then what we do is we don't allow to pin pages that are not exclusive, and we never share pages that might be pinned. And using that set of rules, I would say, you can then, yeah, this is the current situation. This is the current situation in the kernel. Uh, so you, you can actually say, well, uh, I can never have an um, anonymous page pin that is shared. And that's the most important part that we care about. So um, you might wonder, well, if we don't allow pinning an anonymous page that might be shared, what are we going to do if we don't allow that? Well, the answer is fairly easy. If we want to take a read-only pin on the read-only mapped anonymous page that's not exclusive, we're going to trigger unsharing. And unsharing might sound a little bit weird, but it's essentially a write fault without mapping the page writable. So we create a dedicated exclusive copy, and we map it read-only, and everything keeps on working. And this work was inspired by Andreas Ark and Shelley work on that. So in our example, we would have a shared anonymous page mapped by two page tables. Uh, we're going to trigger a write. Uh, uh, we want to take a read-only pin on one on this page, for example, via page table zero. In that case, we have to trigger unsharing. Unsharing would create like a private copy, just as we would do for a write fold. And uh, we would map that page read-only because we're not intending to write to it. And at that point, we can again pin that page and everybody's happy. Um, now you might wonder, well, in our example on the right side, what would happen if somebody would try to pin the, uh, the page that's still mapped into page table one? Because obviously it's not marked as exclusive, it might be shared. Uh, and the rule we apply here is we're only going to reuse the page just if, if the page count is one. So um, at that point, we no longer have to deal with any kind of uh, correctness issues with pins getting out of sync or security issues. At that point, we just reuse it if there is a single reference and we can be sure that it's no longer shared. Uh, lately, we've seen some other uh, applications of page on an exclusive, which are, I think, quite nice. So, for example, what I added is when you have a protection change of a VMA range from uh, read-only to read-write, uh, what we can actually do is we can see test, well, if this page is exclusive, if it's an exclusive anonymous page, we can simply map the page immediately writable and essentially avoid a write fault in that case. And we, we can be sure that this is the correct thing to do because that just mimics what our new copy and write logic essentially does. If the page is exclusive, we can map it writable without any additional work. 
The other application that uh, I recently added is uh, actually a fix for security issue that we found, uh, which is, um, we named it Dirty Cow for shared memory only. Uh, some of you still might recall what Dirty Cow was all about. You were essentially able to modify any uh, read-only file that you were able to map uh, using that mechanism. And here for this CV, it was essentially being able to only map or modify shared memory that you don't have write access to. And um, it's the same issue, the same thing essentially, um, whenever we use this debug access, which is like using full force to bypass VMA restrictions uh, if we don't have write access, we're gonna make sure that we aren't allowed to pin a page that's exclusive and then we're, we're fine in that regard. Last but not least, something I'm working on right now is um, using the same mechanism in our NUMA hinting code. So NUMA hinting code is essentially uh, mapping a page prod non such that we will trap the next success and then we can decide if we want to migrate the page to some other memory location or not. And uh, one optimization we had was using the saved write infrastructure to, to avoid write faults after we, we had, for example, an initial read fault on, on some prod non protected page. And here again, we can essentially apply the same mechanism as for our mProtect um, yeah, upgrade of write permissions and replace saved write. So that's not upstream yet, that's what I'm working on right now. So uh, what's missing? Um, on the one hand, huge TLB is still a problem. Uh, huge TLB, uh, if you recall, is um, having huge pages, not transparent huge pages, but real huge pages for processes, and they still use the map count to make copy and write decisions. And the issue is um, that we can actually result in unnecessary copies in the new approach, because if, you, if, if we consider our example again, um, we're only gonna reuse the page if there is a single reference on it, and that, of course, might mean that we might do an unnecessary copy in certain cases. And UGTB kind of really deal with that because it's a fixed pool size and if you would do an unnecessary copy you would deliver and you're running out of huge pages, you would uh, essentially send the process a sick bus and kill it. So we cannot really do that. Odirect still uses the wrong interface for pinning and pinning pages. Uh, it uses full get and not full pin, but John Hubbard is working on that actively. And the nice thing, once we have that in place, is that we can actually remove from our man pages the notion that Odirect and fork should not be used because from that point on, it should be fully functional, just like it, how it's supposed to be. Uh, we have to preserve uh, the exclusive flag on more architectures, so that's a minor detail. Whenever we swap out a page on some architectures, we lose that exclusive information, which is not too bad because the page cannot be pinned if we actually succeed in, in swapping that page out. Uh, but, of course, it means that we might detect pages as not exclusive and maybe shared instead of yeah, just detecting it properly and avoiding some corner cases of performance issues. I mentioned good fast handling. Good fast is uh, very tricky, and we have one pending fix for a page and an exclusive um, where we race between pinning a page and clearing the flag, and it's all a big mess and mystery, uh, but we're getting there. And of course, we need self test to make sure that it's not silently breaking again, uh, which has been the case a couple of times already, and I'm working on that. Having that said, um, are there any questions, any topics for discussion? Otherwise, otherwise I would just start going over my topics and um, yeah, start doing that. Not? We're going to talk. And maybe, maybe <laughs> Matthew might have a comment regarding. <laughs> You mentioned earlier on that there's going to be some special games played with uh, zero size, uh, zero order folios. I'm wondering how far are we away from being able to separately allocate folios? Because then that will list a lot of those restrictions, restrictions on what we can have in a folio. And if that makes need for special games and hacks go away, maybe we could put some more effort in that direction. Uh, good point. Um, at, at this point, with page and exclusive, I don't think we're talking about hex anymore. Um, but I agree that especially the pin count might deserve some attention. And I think John, John, you also had some concerns regarding the pin count. I think unreliability with file file back pages. So for anonymous pages, I think we're good. But especially with page cache pages, I remember John had some issues with that. Uh, yeah. The the problem is that. Like you said, we're we're using 
an, an additional page to store an accurate pin count. So if you have more than one page in your folio, great. If you only have one page, then you need somewhere to store that ref count like you already pointed out. And, and Matthew is um, uh, turning the pages inside out so that I, I think we can put a counter in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, so my, my, my hope is actually to do away with or at least significantly shrink map count. And so we just get to a saturated map count and, and, and give up trying to keep an accurate count. I'm not sure we're going to get there. I think I may have overlooked something important, but that's that, that's where I'm currently looking. Uh, that, that would let If really raising that, you could run into issues. So um, I, I completely agree that we could look into that, and maybe like we don't maybe don't need a pin count that is 32 bit wide. Like we would have to figure out what actually makes sense then. And this might get tricky with the page cache and when we use like um, also the pin count for O direct in all of these cases. Like what would be a good number that that you want to have, like how many people can concurrently read via OData from a page cache page? How many processes? And that would be interesting, I think. Crazy, crazy idea. Uh, what about just like merging KSM, like kernel share memory, with all these map count, uh, copy and write, so that we only have one mechanism? Like so, so KSM is uh, sharing the same page read only. And technically, copy and write is the same idea, really, if you think about it fundamentally. But it's a crazy idea, just like. <laughs> that a while back, remember that made that made it into the document on separate splitting up struct page and separately allocating those objects. And I think the thing that we talked about was a KSM would be a separate type of object than a folio, and a KSM would have multiple folios hanging off of it. So yes, it's on the roadmap, but we need to first get to separately allocating folios. Which is a five-year project. <laughs> I mean, let, let, let's be clear, that's not happening anytime soon. If, if we're talking about something we're doing like next year, it's not separately allocated folios. Talking about here, because when that happens, then all the things that you're talking about here of deciding how many bits we need for this counter, uh, bias counts, don't need to play those games anymore. It just won't be that big of a deal to have another eight or 16 bytes in the folio. So if there's things that people could, could do to help out to get us a little bit closer to separately alloc allocating folios, I think we should seriously like talk about that. 
So I think we might still like uh, what I recall from all of the um, like metadata optimizations, dynamically allocating it. We could actually have for page cache pages and for anonymous pages, we could have different metadata and the size could vary. Correct. Uh, that 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 is the the the, the destiny. Yeah, that we do intend to have def different structs for anonymous and and page cache memory. And for example, for anonymous pages, we might not need that. We might not need a reliable pin count. Um, because it might be reliable enough, but for page cache pages, as John raised, we might want that. And we're not playing too many games now with anonymous memory. It's, it's, it's. It, it, I think it's, uh, it's handleable. Like if you have like, you you would need 1,024 references on an exclusive anonymous page. And if like everybody or direct and so forth is is actually just using the pin interface, then who should take 1,024 pins and page, uh, references on a page? It's not going to happen. Um, but yeah, for page cache pages, I, I agree that this might might be a very good thing that we can allocate this metadata dynamically and squeeze the pin count in there, um, or yeah, modify the map count. I, th I think we're already out of time. <laughs> yeah, I'm inclined to give you a couple of extra minutes because you did have to start a little late while we did the intros. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up soon. I just wanted to say, I, I really like the questions you've asked at the end there, particularly about do we need to need a map count per THP subpage? Because that is something that we need to get rid of in order to move to separately allocated. So it doesn't just help us in the future, it helps us like right now. Also, it's it's going to be a huge performance win because right now you to get a map count, you have to scan all 512 times 64 byte pages in order to uh, find out what your, what your accurate map count is. And it's a pain because it's almost always zero. <laughs> so the, the, the issue is here, so the, the, the general idea is that like we have these map counts per sub page and like we don't really need that anymore for uh, making copy and write decisions to handle that correctly. So the question is like, what else does actually need a reliable map, map count? And I think like the most prominent examples detecting if there are other page table mappings, for example, in our map code, the issue is if you have a combined map count for a transparent huge pit, for example, you account everything to like the, the head page or whatsoever. Um, if you have like a transparent huge pet page map via, uh, via PDEs, you would already have 512. So um, making the map count less reliable would mean you have to keep at least 512 um, to only be able to identify it's it, like this, it's mapped once into a process. And that's then I guess the interesting discussion like can we get rid of the transparent like of the sub page map count I think we can to some degree um, I'm not sure about like all of these games that the page cache pages are playing with that but um, you, you might know better than me for anonymous pages we might not need that yeah I think we need to get into a hack room at some point fairly soon and figure this out because <laughs> I think you know a lot more about anonymous memory than I do and I know more about page cache memory than you do and yeah we just need to figure this out all right, let's uh, let's let's, let's wrap, wrap it up. Thank exactly. you so much, David. Sure. Of course, everyone. <laughs>
So if from my companion here, just exit screen yes. after, after the slide. After the slide. And then we continue with non full screen or switch it back. So I'll keep it non non full screen after after. Oh, okay, got it. Great. Um, yep. It sounds on. So, like it's on. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Seren Bagdasarian. Uh, we will be present, uh, presenting all three of us. This is Liam from Oracle, Liam Powell, and uh, Michelle Lespinas uh, from Facebook. So we are working on scalability, scalability solutions for MMAPLOCK, and we'll talk about some updates in that area. So more specifically, we'll talk about maple trees, uh, SPF, and RVMA logs. And let's see. So a quick recap about this issue. So um, the issue is basically that uh, MAPSTRAC has a one um, read-write semaphore which protects the whole MM and which is taken for write whenever we uh, make modifications to VMA tree or VMA flags and which is taken for read uh, by the page, uh, page fault handlers. And uh, because this uh, lock covers the whole MM, uh, it doesn't allow um, to, to have parallel updates and uh, page faults, even if they happen in different VMAs. So it basically is, the lock is very coarse grained and that prevents some of the uh, parallelism that might have been actually achieved if it was more uh, fine grained. And we have seen issues uh, caused by that in Android when we, um, uh, when applications have mul multiple threads and they set up their stacks, which is basically updating VMAs and there are page faults going, going on in parallel. Also, the same issue was reported in Google Fibers and we have seen some issues also with uh, SMAP and MMAP interfaces related to that. Um, so Leon will talk about maple trees and updates in this area? Uh, yeah, so uh, the maple tree updates kind of uh, uh, where we are right now. Um, I added the maple tree uh, mainly to try and reduce the, the number of uh, the messiness of, of updating the list of VMAs. So uh, the VMA is tracked right now with three uh, structures, and basically we're removing that to, to make it just the one structure. So when you want to change the list, you can just use one interface to do it all. Uh, that's pretty important when you're looking at uh, the locking, adding and removing. Um, you don't want to be locking to change the, uh, the link list and everything. So the, uh, the one structure kind of cleans up what we're doing in the code and removes the complexity of, of something that's already um, tension in the code itself. So that's kind of where we're, we're going there. Um, so yeah, there's other uses for the maple tree, but it's outside of the scope of the talk. It also allow, will allow us for, to look up the VMAs um, without locks, right, uh, under our seal? Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's uh, lockless. It can be RCU uh, safe. Uh, right now it's not operating in RCU safe mode. It's in the uh, Linux next tree. It's not operating in RCU safe mode. Uh, I didn't really want to uh, suggest we go there yet because a lot of people think that that will add a lot of complexity to tracking the VMAs. Uh, but if we need to, it is possible. And for those who want to know more about the maple tree. Yes, if you want to learn more about the maple tree, there's a talk later on. Uh, Wednesday at? Wednesday, uh, yes, uh, the afternoon. <laughs> In the afternoon <laughs> track. <laughs> Thank you, Liam. And uh, Michelle will present uh, updates on the SPF front. Right, so um, SPF, that, that's been uh, an effort that uh, 
actually it's been worked over many years. Uh, I kind of picked it up from uh, Laurent. Um, what it does is that it tries to do page faults without taking the mmap lock. And um, so you can think of it a bit like a transaction. It will, uh, there's um, a per mm counter that every writer will increment. And so it will, uh, it will at the start of the page fault check that there's no writer uh, in progress. And then it will try to do the entire page fault, and when it's time uh, to commit the result of the page fault at the end, which is to add the, the new page into the process uh, address space, it will already have taken the page table lock at that point, and that can be a synchronization point. It will double check that, the, that there's still no writer and that there's been no writer in between. And so it knows that the whole work that, that, that it's done uh, is still valid at that point, and it will try to commit the transaction at that point. Uh, and if that doesn't work, then it will just release that page and uh, retry the whole thing, taking the log this time. So uh, the, um, the idea there is to try to do page faults without having to take the, the Nmap lock. Um, there's working code for that. Uh, there's not enough consensus about it right now. We, we kind of had a about it uh, last time in Pondering. So out of that came the third approach that um, that's going to be discussed, which is uh, to try to have per VMA logs. Right. And uh, and we also plan to, to have uh, SPF trees for people who want to try it and, uh, you know, maybe that we will find more use cases that uh, benefit from it. Um, so as Michelle noticed, um, uh, so this VMA, uh, per, per VMA logs idea basically came up after uh, we discussed the um, speculative page faults uh, during the LSFMM in April. And the idea is basically um, to have a lock which is uh, finer grain that's a map lock and which will cover just specific VMAs. Uh, so basically each VMA now gets a, a read-write semaphore lock um, it will be taken for write, just like with mmap lock case, whenever VMA is being modified, unmapped, mapped, remapped, and so on, or uh, flags are changed. And page faults will look up the VMA under RCU protection, and then uh, when it finds it, it will lock it, will we'll check it that it's still uh, valid, because under RCU it's, um, it will return you a VMA, but it will, might return a wrong VMA, so we have to double check after we locked it. And if it's still valid, then we basically proceed and we know that VMA is valid and it's not locked. Um, let me see. So issues that uh, became quite apparent right from the start that was that um, Per VMA locks are uh, just following the usual lock and lock pattern is not, it complicates things um, when it's, um, when we're talking about per VMA locks. Uh, there are several issues that uh, one of them is we might need to lock multiple VMAs within one update. So when I talk about one update, that means when we take mmap lock and then we release mmap lock, so that's kind of a transaction. So within one transaction, we might need to lock multiple VMAs, for example, during the VMA split or merge. Um, and that requires tracking those VMAs. That also requires careful ordering of locks and locks to prevent deadlocks. Uh, another issue is that locking and unlocking might happen in different functions in different levels. Um, locking might happen in one function, which is called by another function, which already locked that VMA. So all those um, little details add complexity. Um, therefore, uh, and also another big thing is that at the end, we need to unlock multiple VMAs potentially, and that's better be done in, uh, in an efficient way. 
Um, so all that basically brought up the idea of having a, um, a different locking pattern where we, instead of locking, unlocking each VMA, we basically, during the transaction, we mark specific VMAs locked. And uh, at the end, we just unmark all of them. And the way we, uh, I achieved that is by uh, having sequence counters, both in VMA and MM. And the rules are pretty simple. When those sequence counters are equal, the VMA is locked. And when they are not equal, the VMA is free, so it's not locked. So when we want to mark a VMA locked, we take the lock, we uh, set the VMA's sequence counter equal to MM sequence counter, and we unlock that VMA. So when reader goes and checks if the VMA is locked, it just needs to check whether those two values agree. This allows us to easily uh, lock multiple VMAs within a transaction. Basically what you do, you assign the same sequence number to them. And when you have to unlock, you just change the MM's sequence counter, and that automatically unlocks the locked VMA or VMAs that are marked as locked. Um, that idea came up after the first version, which I uh, uh, posted internally within some group, and I think it was David Lore who reviewed that. And the original version had a list of locked VMAs, and he said it's horrible because we potentially have to walk thousands of VMAs um, just to unlock all of them. So iteration might take quite some time. Um, so that's the ba basic idea and that's the basic deviation from the original suggestions that Matthew did about per so, VMA locks. So I'm guessing you have uh, some kind of retry loop if uh, you enter the read and right. sequence counter. Yes, just like with speculative page faulting, if as a Page, uh, page fault handler, it doesn't lock, it try, tries to lock the per VMA lock, and if it fails, it uh, falls back on the MMAP lock uh, mechanism. Um, if in my testings, again, I'm testing usually with Android, it's less than 0.01% uh, when we have to do that. Uh, again, it doesn't guarantee that in all cases we will have such a high success rate, but it's, it already shows that uh, in most cases we don't have to fall back on this. And that there are other cases where we'll fall back to taking the MM. So, for example, the, uh, the, the RB tree walk can lead us to the wrong VMA if it's being modified at the same time that we walked under RCU. And in that case, we'll also fall back to the MMAP send. Right. And just to clarify, right now, uh, what the patch sets, the RFC that I posted, it handles only anonymous pages which are not swapped back. But we have plans to basically enable it for more cases for both file back pages and swap back pages. So it was also uh, mentioned that user fold D also can't handle it right now, but we can figure out how to handle them too. Um, I think it's, it's worth mentioning, so I wasn't aware of this and you still haven't put it in your commit messages. Our standard red black tree in the co uh, code in the kernel now has provisions for uh, making modifications safe for concurrent readers, which is really cool. And I think more people should know about. Happy somebody likes it. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there are more questions. Yeah. Uh, I think like after following the upstream discussion, I think there was one concern that there is an issue with there is still an issue without speculative page faults if the, we have fairly large VMAs, right? Yes. Right. So, uh, as Peter Z noticed, that if we have just one VMA, uh, this does, is not going to help anyway because basically you're replacing one big lock with another big lock. Um, this, in, in our case, we are targeting a different issue where we want to allow. Um, you know, the concurrent updates and page faults when when the updates are happening in the different VMAs. For to allow such a thing for a one big VMA, we have to have like granular locks, not per VMA, but even more fine grained. Yeah, my, my, my question would have been: Has anybody already looked into splitting such large VMAs into? Smaller yet yet still large VMAs to see if this could 
help some of the workloads that are still suffering. I mean, if you have like a one terabyte VMA, cut it down into whatever, 1,024 oh, VMAs. I, and I mean, some updates will be slower, but I mean. Oh, some, some logic basically in the kernel, which would um, break up a huge VMA into multiple ones to, to okay. avoid this. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like if somebody already tried that, I mean, you need some kind of heuristic, ob obviously. Yeah, but I haven't tried it and I have, haven't heard about such a uh, um, activity. Um, but I have seen some out of tree code that did that, that broke big VMAs into smaller ones. Mm -hmm. um, generally, I think, especially for anonymous VMAs, the, the VMAs don't really align well with uh, user space visible context, with user space user space objects like you could have two threads doing two M maps and the kernel will happily put them next to each other and create one big vma to cover them both and you 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 could argue that with files the, the things are aligned better to uh, user space visible things but for unknown vmas that it really doesn't align well so that's kind of what I don't like about the idea of uh, per VMA logs is that uh, it kind of goes counter to what the kernel does when it merges adjacent VMAs. Well, the merging is one optimization, right? And we have a different optimization. So my question wouldn't exactly be how to combine these both optimizations. Yeah, I mean, I... We, we have a maximum of number of VMAs per process that's clear, but I mean, you, for example, as, as long as you stay under a certain limit, you could say, well, like if I have something bigger than whatsoever, I'm going to split it up or do another walkover, like after some runtime, do a walkover in the process. But that's just some wild ideas because like I, I remember mm -hmm. Peter's comment regarding these large VMAs. Yeah, no, that's a good idea that might make this even more useful. As a use cases that we currently target is when uh, basically we have many VMAs and because the lock is so big, we cannot really um, benefit from the fact that, you know, we have different areas and there's no reason really to prevent one from page faulting in one area when you are updating completely unrelated area. So that's our ba uh, main target right now. But yeah, if uh, one big VMA becomes or we have, we see more use cases where there is an issue with big VMAs. Maybe a logic to speed it up would, would make sense. Proper heuristic sounds like it depends on user space access patterns. And I suspect that we're not going to have any daemon. <laughs> Any, any knowledge or bounds on what kind of access patterns those are. I, I wouldn't expect them to be a flat random distribution. And I think like there's Daemon that tries to monitor exactly that. And, okay. and I mean, Daemon even does VMA modifications and optimizations, flying flags, paging out stuff. So maybe that could be one thing on top. Yeah, it, it's heuristics, I'm guessing. Yeah. yeah, I guess we will need to build up some kind of uh, mechanism to collect statistics to figure out, you know, what, what kind of heuristics would be useful and in which cases. But yeah, this, that investigation hasn't been done yet. Um, I, one thing I noticed uh, when we we're talking about this is that we didn't, I don't know if you mentioned that your code specifically uses the RB tree. Uh, it doesn't use the maple tree yet. Right. Uh, and that came up also when Matthew mentioned that the RB tree is uh, RCU safe and that you can walk it, but you have to make sure you land on the right node because if there's an edit in the RCU tree at the same time you end up, you could end up in the completely wrong location. Um, so that check will go away and make the code simpler once we switch this to maple tree. Um, it's also worth noting that we have to switch to maple tree because of the other two structures that are used to track the VMAs. Yeah, yeah, maple tree definitely make it simpler and that code is quite separated so that when that switch happens, we can just change in one place and um, should be easy. And the other thing I was thinking when you were talking about splitting up the VMAs is when we map a new VMA, we check the previous and the next to see if it can be merged. So <laughs> we would do this dance right now where we would split it and then merge it to the next one. Uh, so that would be 
something we would have to look at if we we're going to optimize by splitting up the VMAs. And when we do that, we end up needing to we end up needing to change the AMAP interval trees while holding the 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 same log that protects the, um, the arbitrary or the what? By right, the interval tree has to be updated for the gaps. Is what you mean? Yes. Yeah. We need to. We need to. You can't. Uh, you cannot. You cannot update the interval trees for AMAP without holding the, the mapping for the direct mapping. Uh, right, the, the, the log for the direct mapping at the same time. Yeah. And I have to update both together. Right, or it, there's a trick to hide it or something, right? Right now in the code. In the R map. I'm not sure either. <laughs> We'll need some more discussions. <laughs> it's a complicated <laughs> problem. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If no more questions, I I would like some people to try the pre-VMA logs when I post V1. Right now it's in RFC state and there were already some uh, comments which require uh, basically changing it a little bit. But once a V1 is out, it would be really useful if people can run some benchmarks and let me know if there are any regressions, because that's my biggest worry, that in some cases, basically, instead of taking one lock, we have to take multiple locks. And I do want to know if it regresses any use cases or workloads. That would be really, really good input from the community. That's definitely helpful. That, uh, if I understand implementation correctly, you could always, like you could have a magic toggle that always falls back to the slow path and like would allow you to like, like change it in the code fairly easily to either enable or disable the whole optimization. Right, but for example, in exit and map, we have to take, right now we're just taking a map log and that way we, we can uh, guarantee that there is no page faults happening in parallel. Uh, but with per VMA logs, we basically, in cases when we treat a process as one whole, not collection of VMAs, we have to take all of them to just make sure that it's protected completely. Uh, I need to talk to Michal Hoko about exit MM. Um, maybe it's not required to, to log all the VMAs. I think it's required, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but in those cases, when we treat basically the whole MM as a whole, rather than its parts, we have to take multiple VMAs instead of one, uh, multiple logs instead of one, and that might affect some workloads. I haven't seen that. I've, I've run a number of benchmarks, haven't seen uh, the regression, but doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So if, you know, more people can try it out and let me know, that would be really helpful. You've got one minute left. So. Like you're exiting, so. Uh, technically, yes, but still, you, you know, if we can avoid regression anywhere, we should try that. Uh, actually, it was the last last patch in my RFC uh, addressed that a little bit because we noticed that with RCUs, uh, with freeing VMAs, when we take too many times so RCU, especially when. Uh, callback offloading is enabled, it regresses the exit path. So I had to implement that uh, bulk freeing of VMAs basically as the last patch to address that. But again, if there are more cases like that, I would I would want to know. And it does seem a little silly, but the exit path, people do care about it a lot because when you're shutting right. something down, you have to get that test to be finished before you can start something else. So people actually really care about it. It's one of the top things on one of our lists somewhere. So it matters. Okay. All right, thank you very much.
sounds better. So I wanted to thank the organization and, and so on. Uh, it's nice to have the conference again. Um, and today I want to talk to you about uh, memory tuning. Um, so in the last, I would say, couple of years or three years, uh, there have been many uh, different patches, uh, patch set about memory tuning. Um, kind of, uh, you know, if, I've, if you haven't done one, uh, you're not a cool kid, I guess. Um, I'm not a cool kid, I haven't done one. Uh, but I think like there's a lot of different uh, ID and different direction is going in. And I wanted to try to uh, take advantages of Linux members to have like maybe a discussion about, um, you know, what can we do, what kind of synergy we can have. Um, because I've seen a bunch of slightly different approaches. So I'm not going to over all the slide I have because uh, really I think the background is pretty, um, is pretty obvious. I'm going to flash most of the slide I have pretty quickly. Um, unless some people raise a hand or ask me to slow down. Uh, but, you know, I want to focus on the discussion more than actually uh, focus on presenting something. So the first thing I wanted to, to, to share with people really is that we have a pyramid of, of, of memory. Uh, and I see like three different things. Uh, people look at latency, bandwidth, and capacity. And usually they don't go uh, in and, you know, like you have a very high bandwidth, low latency, that's what you're looking for. But usually they have a, a low, uh, low capacity. Uh, so that's why you see like this pyramid going uh, in kind of a multiple direction. Um, and so, yeah, you know, we have register, cache, HBM, local CPU, remote CPU, and we have CXL memory and, uh, and we can have even more memory technology on the horizon. Um, you know, I'm just not going to go over too quickly, like capacity profilers and memory performance, the physics, the capacity, and so on. Um, the memory is becoming a large chunk of the TCO. Uh, the capacity and bandwidth is kind of an issue because the CPU core count is actually uh, keep growing faster than actually is the memory bandwidth. If you look at the bandwidth per CPU core, you will see this kind of stagnating. Uh, it's barely improving over the years. Um, and the capacity per core is improved, but uh, slower than the needs apparently. Like uh, we are told that many workloads are wanting more and more memory. Um, and at the same time, there is a physics limit. The density of memory, you know, is coming to an end um, because of the processing and so on. Uh, so we won't see much more improvement inside density. So, you know, we kind of going from this world where you just have the cache and the memory on, on your CPU to a world where you have like multiple hierarchy of memory uh, from the cache, the HBM. HBM is like a local fast memory connected on the same time or with die interposer. So very fast um, and you can have multiple tier, like I'm just showing two tier memory and so on. So anyways, it's, uh, I'm assuming it's very obvious to most of the people here in the room. Um, obviously, we want to keep the same performance really, uh, you know, we want all data to be in the fastest memory and so on. Um, there's two things here I kind of want to point out, you know, you can try to achieve all this through hardware, but that's what the cache is doing really for, for a long time. Uh, but I believe there's a limit to what you can do in hardware, uh, there's a limit to what you can do with the cache. And I think it's been, you know, uh, um, um, an area where like a CPU manufacturer have been always struggling with cache and multiple cache levels and so on. Uh, there is, I think, uh, a limit where you can scale you know, cache size versus core point and so on. So I believe we're going to need software for that. Um, one thing I want to point out to remind people is that an application cannot access all its data at all time. You know, it's only going to be able, able to access a subset of its data sets for most applications. Some applications are like, you know, uh, duck somewhere over there that uh, can access all its data because there is a very small data set, but it's not the kind of application we're worrying here about. Um, and so there's like two other things I want to point out, explicit versus, versus implicit. So explicit placement is what an application is deciding by itself where it wants to place its memory, uh, which kind of uh, uh, physical memory you want to use, and the implicit placement is well, somebody else, whether the kernel, some kind of demon, somebody else is trying to place uh, memory on the behalf of the thing. So if you think about it, it's all like NUMA, all again, you know, asymmetric bandwidth and latency. Um, it's very much what we've been uh, seeing with NUMA. Um, and NUMA can, can have different flavor, you know, when you only have two socket, it's kind of easy, very symmetrical. But when you start having more than two socket, four socket, or even more, uh, then, you know, you don't necessarily have, have multiple paths um, across all the, all the sockets, so you can have a, a, a more asymmetric and more complex topology. Well, why, why does multiple paths make any difference to latency? So, um, like in the example I'm giving, like it's all the same latency, but if you have like a more complex topology, you can... Whoa.
Please stand by, we're experiencing minor technical difficulties. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, so you can have two paths with different latency. Um, that's, I don't think that, that's very I don't think there's any, uh, anybody doing that today. Um, I, is that something that's going to happen with CXL? Um, most likely, uh, in some of the topology I've seen. Um, so, you know, brace for you. <laughs> brace yourself, I guess. Um, what I wanted to point out with Numa really is that uh, the uh, lesson we, 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 have, we can take from Numa is that uh, only a small subset of application actually uh, are Numa aware. A very few application took the, uh, um, you know, uh, the artwork of uh, actually trying to uh, leverage uh, Numa, um, which is um, most of a large application. Uh, some application leverage Numa through library, you know, memory allocation library and so on. Um, you know, and also, obviously, you have mechanism like autonoma uh, kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, for memory tiering, the definition I want, I think everybody that has been looking into memory tiering is like using cold pages. A page has not been accessed um, in the last n millisecond. Usually, it's like a minute or so. Um, and old page is not accessed more than some number of time over the same kind of period. Um, and that you have this kind of two, two thing. Um, and so, like, you have this. Uh, continuous flow of pages, you know, cold pages go from fast to your memory to slower memory, and odd pages uh, go via other direction, um, you know, a perpetual movement. Um, and one of the big questions is how do you measure success, really? How you do know that you're taking the best decision? Um, and the metrics people have been using is really the percentage of memory access that use the fast memory. So if uh, your application is using 100% of its memory access going to the fast memory, then you should assume that uh, there is no regression from a performance point of view. But if your application wants to start using the slower memory, 50% uh, of your memory access is now going to the slower memory, then there is a lot of chance that you actually your application is going slower than uh, it could go. Um, but it's also not a silver bullet. Some application have um, uh, a background task that is actually dominating the memory access. But what is um, most important to the application is a very low latency. Um, which do a bare, bare minimum access. So, you know, it's like a very corner case or So, um, so the, the four kind of component I want to talk, and that's really where I wanted to spend most of the time, is um, um, around uh, the, the, the component to use. So, cold pages, uh, odd page detection, and page migration and policy and management. Um, so, that's going to be the discussion part. So for the cold page detection, uh, I think the most obvious one is really uh, the least recently used kind of. Um, so that's the first you can use, uh, the first kind of thing you can use from the kernel. If a page has not been used, um, you know, is, is at the bottom of the LRU, uh, it's much likely that this page is a good candidate to actually be migrated instead of, you know, instead of being reclaimed. Uh, like if it's a swap page or going back to disk or, you know, some, some other kind of reclaimed swap. Uh, you can migrate it to a slower memory, um, cheaper memory. Um, so I think that's the first kind of candidate, first patch it about that. I think it's meta that has a patch it for that. I think it's a good mechanism from the kernel. So I don't know if people have any. Seems like an application where just an access bit is not really sufficient because it doesn't tell us anything about the rate of accesses to a given page just frequent, like frequency of since last, last, last access, since the bit was cleared. Uh, has there been any, any look at hardware performance counters or possibly start talking to the hardware people about getting more useful performance counters for this? 
Thank you. Uh, person from a hardware company here. Uh, <laughs> yes, there's been a lot of look into that. Um, there's nothing in hardware yet. If people want hardware counters to help you with this stuff, please ask the hardware companies. Those of us that work for hardware companies, we ask for this stuff all the time, and people don't care because we don't write big checks for large numbers of CPUs. So if you guys are writing big checks for CPUs, tell the CPU companies you want this stuff. It'll make it happen faster. <laughs> just, just to follow up on the access bits, you, you're right that you can only, from one read, you only get the was it touched at all. But people have been looking at statistical stuff where you keep checking and build up some stats over time and get a better idea. Sometimes hardware assisted. Uh, yeah, there's another hardware company here. <laughs> uh, it, it's funny you bring up the access bit thing because we were just looking at, at some access access counters uh, that, that we have on GPUs, and those were batched up in ways that I've always hated. You know, because it's not one access bit per page; it's one access bit, or you get a certain number of access bits, not not very many, like four thousand, to cover your whole GPU memory space. So I've always been vaguely dissatisfied with that. But um, we started looking at it as a way to say, well, can, you know, are these any good at all? And people started measuring and uh, as a way to augment your other measurement techniques, uh, we got measurable improvements. Um, like you're saying, Dave, it's, it's hard to really build up enough um, of an argument to win over all the other things that the hardware might be doing with its area and its, you know, its silicon. There's a lot of other stuff that you could be doing. You could be scattering little bits of SRAM throughout your chip, or you could be making magical AI things. It's, it's infinite. And access bits, um, it's it's hard to make a case. We, we have made a case, so we have some, but we I don't see us. I'd be happy with just getting one access bit per page, for heaven's sakes. I, I, Getting counters is unimaginable at this point. So just kind of a little snapshot from, from one hardware company. I want to point out one thing is like for cold pages, access bit is good enough because for cold pages, we're looking at a page that has not been accessed for a long time. So, you know, if the access bit is clear, we clear it, we look at it, at it next next minute. And if nobody has set it again for one minute, we know the page is cold. So for cold pages, it's really nice. But for old pages, it's kind of a different topic. And that's where we want the other people to help us because, um, and I think I have a, so you know, like if we talk about old pages detection, it's like, that's where we want hardware, I think. I, I, yep. <laughs> okay, so, so like, let's maybe switch to old pages and I will go back to our cold pages too. So for, for old pages, um, that's where the biggest issue is because for uh, old pages, you know, yeah, uh, the idea is that uh, you have access frequencies that is going up. So if you guys trying to sample with software, it means the CPU overhead of your sampling is going to be higher because you need to sample frequently. Um, but that's not something you want to do. You don't want to spend too much on your CPU cycle, your pre-CPU cycle, your cycle um, to just sampling the memory access of your other process. You know, it's like a, um, <laughs> monitoring your process and spending most of your time monitoring your process instead of actually letting your process doing some work. Um, so that's where really I think we want to have um, kind of hardware uh, to help us. But the one of the issue, and I think John was like pointing out, is like you know you have four thousand counter, um, and if at the if at the time you have like four thousand cold pages and then suddenly you have like eight thousand cold pages that are coming out, you're gonna miss half of them. Um, so how do you deal with that? Because yeah, it's, it's kind of a hard problem, so. But, I mean, so are you, the only thing is, uh, caching kind of defeats this, right? Because if, you, if, you, if, you're, if you've got a really hot cache line, you're not going to be bumping the counter on the page while you're just accessing this you know, cache lines in L1. So w would you want the, the, uh, the, the, access bit, the access counter to be incremented when the cache line moves from L, L2 to L1? I mean, you know, you've got three instructions in a sequence which all reference this page. Is that three accesses or is that, well, this is one burst. It, it's really hard to know exactly what it is you want. I, I, I can't even think of what, what, whether that should count as one or as three accesses. You just have to make a decision about it, right? So, I mean, you can say things in the caches, what are you trying to measure here? Are you trying to measure like how, how much the media matters in your transaction? And that's what we came up with in, in one way was to say, hey, if it's hitting the caches, we don't care about this counting stuff because the caches are helping us out here. So we're going to concentrate on something like at the memory controller level and say, hey, how much is this hitting the data in the memory controller? So that's one way to look at it. 
you could say, hey, the caches do matter, um, but you know, you come up with a different answer on a different hardware design. Something, something that I've been wanting lately in a different context is some way of estimating how expensive a given memory access is. Because it, that can vary wildly. Is it contended? Is it, uh, I mean, is it in cache? That's really, really hard. And, and because it changes, right? And it changes so much depending on where the memory is, if it's cached and all that stuff. So I don't know, I, th I think that's a really, really hard problem. It's even harder than saying, how much is this byte out on this memory controller that access? It'd be great to have, it's just very, very hard to come up with. I'm sorry, uh, somebody raised hand in the remote session, so can you speak up, Bharata? Yeah, yes, this is Bharata here. So on the topic of uh, uh, having hardware assistance uh, to detect the hot pages, uh, okay. there are things like uh, instruction-based samplings that recent uh, AMD processors uh, have come up with. Uh, I have made a few attempts to add things to some of the descriptive standards, and the pushback from that side is prove you need it. And at the moment, no one has, so they're not interested. Yeah, and one way to prove that you need it is to like simulate this stuff, right? It is, it's quite possible that build something that pretends to be a piece of hardware and does it by scanning page table access bits. Because we have this data, right, in the hashtag bits, but it takes a lot of time to go and churn through them and figure it out. So that kind of thing exists. I mean, there's a prototype inside of Intel that does something like that. Um, just try and prove that we need it. Um, but, uh, you know, help us make the case. We'd love to have more data, so. I'll tell you where it's come out for me, uh, if it's all right, uh, I did a lazy per CPU counters recently, and there we want to switch adaptively to per CPU counters if the update rate is high enough. That's how we do it now, because if it's updated infrequently, if that cache line is not going to be contended, then an atomic counter is going to be cheaper because it's saving you a pointer fetch. When it becomes contended, we want to switch to per-CPU counters. And I'm doing it with just a counter, and we, we check the la how often that counter is getting incremented. But, I mean, so that works, but if you come up with something better, and that's... I've seen other places in the kernel where we could be doing these adaptive algorithms if we had a good way of getting the data. I just want to add a, a, a couple of notes to the, the, the thing here. Um, one of them is that auto, autonuma is incredibly harmful for at least one use case. And that's where if you've got a CPU and some other device, maybe, you know, GPU, <laughs> and uh, an autonuma just goes through and it, it unmaps things, but it's unaware of the other devices. And so then you take unnecessary page faults on, on the other devices. Um, so we've seen that this from a performance point of view for running compute programs. I want to toss that in because I saw that listed as something that, oh, we can use autonuma to figure things out. And I'm here to tell you that one of my missions over the next few years is to be to, to make sure that we can turn auto NUMA off um, at either automatically or, or whatever. Um, I just want to dump that on you. Um, and, and the other one I want to mention is that the latency and bandwidth, uh, not, not even mentioning capacity, but if you look in HMAT, which is that ACPI table to describe memory, it has latency and bandwidth and you can list them. And so we had this internal conversation about, oh, that's nice, Let's what, what do we put in there? And and sure, we put in we can put in some numbers, and then well, what is the kernel going to do? Well, well, nobody knows yet. And oh, how do they compare them? Well, you know, we don't we don't even know which one the kernel's going to use, or is it going to use both? It's going to multiply them together and figure out some other thing. So all this is an unknown area, and I'm antsy about it being done right. So I just wanted to. Yeah, and one thing also you've described in this talk is you've talked about things being slower or faster, like that's a one-dimensional thing. And like you mentioned, read bandwidth and latency are problems here. So we have we have memory types that are both higher bandwidth and worse latency. So there's some really nasty complications to all this, just to throw one more thing in there. We, we, we have a bit of an AV issue. I'm just going to uh, relay Barras's question. Uh, rec recent AMD, well, comment perhaps, uh, recent AMD processors of IBS instruction-based sampling that could provide information about page accesses, which page got access from cache or DRAM or remote, remote link DRAM, et cetera. Could we explore using these with new balancing to detect and migrate hot pages from lower tiers? And then he notes uh, that it is sampling based. So I think the short answer there is absolutely yes. The same kinds of counters exist on other vendor CPUs as well. Um, 
we've done some, so Huang Ying, who, who is doing some of the autonuma-based memory migration stuff, did some experiments, um, and some other folks as well, to try and figure out, to try and consume those things in order to do memory tearing. Um, they work functionally, it, it, it's actually just fine. Um, the, the trick though that we had was building useful data out of those performance counters, um, because they, they vary a whole bunch based on um, some nasty things, but essentially they're really bad for virtualization because of the addresses you get out of them. Um, and it's really hard to turn that just fire hose of data that comes out of the performance counters into like useful, actionable information that would be used in that. So while we would all love to be able to um, automatically put the memory in the right place, I mean, fundamentally, it's a hard problem. And how much have we explored and how much have we, uh, how far have we gone into enabling applications to tell us? what the intent to do with a given piece of memory. For example, if I'm going to stream something, I don't care if it's far away, as long as it has a good bandwidth and, uh, and it's pipelined. So uh, how, how much are we thinking or working on trying to define some form of standard, standard way through MAdvise and whatnot to provide that information that will allow the current to make better decisions uh, and not bother scanning heat maps and scanning access bits on regions where we know it's completely pointless. So, uh, I mean, we do have, for example, I think it's M advice sequential or something like that, but I think history told us that people use it for some time and then we stop using it in the kernel and then it's a knob. <laughs> so, uh, I, I guess I tend to agree that it might be worthwhile to look into, but in general, developers are lazy and programs change and um, th that's why we have autonuma at all. Uh, my comment here would be regarding hot pages. Uh, you say here that hot pages are many excesses over a short period of time. But how often would it happen that you have excesses over a short period of time, then you migrate the page and then you realize, well, the page is no longer hot. Yeah, that, that's a big issue also. So sometimes, you know, you detect a hot page, you say, okay, this one is hot, I'm making everything bad faster, and then it becomes cold right, right after that. Exactly. So um, what I would question is, like, how fast are we able, actually required to make a decision? And what, what I just, like, had in mind is, I think recently there was some kind of LOU list resorting based on daemon. And I mean, I, I think they do fairly slow stuff because we're talking about page reclaim. But somehow it has like the same concept. You have some list and you try to see what's most important, which is on front of the list. So I, I guess if you improve one, one mechanism, you could, might benefit from the other. And yeah, but I think the other review for odd pages is, is kind of a the sampling frequency is too too slow. So it's not. Yeah, I don't think it's a good. But you know that's such a feeling more than anything, until somebody uh, can can prove on a large work set that okay, this actually proving to be good or not, uh, it's hard to, uh, to draw a conclusion. Exactly, uh, but, uh, but just like looking at N most recently used addresses, I, I'm not sure if that really helps us to detect hot pages that will remain hot, that are not just like access for Yeah, and, and there is no way to detect that really. Uh, Mel Goldman has a comment that uh, the main limitation on PMU-based PMU sampling were issues that A, constant overhead, B, inability to back off if pages are properly placed, C, consumption of a PMU that is only available for other users, and D, limited to hardware that has the right PMU event available. <clears throat> Just a quick comment about the counters and the tweaking between global counter and per CPU. Just make sure you compare with this CPU ops, which for things like Intel, they use the segment selector uh, uh, register to offset from the CPU. So there may not be this extra uh, different pointer de reference in those situations. So you may not have to do that work. So I think so that's the <laughs> odd page situation. So the cold page I wanted to point out also, Damon. Um, I think like daemon is not really well adapted for cold pages detection. The access bit, like I was saying, the access bit is really good for cold pages, really. Like I think cold pages kind of sold, really. I don't think anybody else has anything beside access bit. So odd page, obviously, we want hardware. Uh, you know, many pitfall. Uh, it can be out for a short period of time and then become cold again. Uh, it can be, uh, you know, like what kind of heuristic we choose. Uh, but we want hardware because the sampling frequency is too high. Um, and there is the issue of how many counter do we want? You know, if we have 4,000, do we want 8,000? Like, you know, how many is good enough? Um, hard to know. And obviously, very silicon cost with that. Um, 
I don't know if you want to to talk more about about pages, maybe just like a minute or two on, on page migration. So on page migration, we have a couple of kernel API. Um, kind of my question is like, do we want more asynchronous API? Do we want something like uh, IUU ring for memory, like page migration can also be used for memory or claim and all this stuff like that. Um, you know, I just like, I'm throwing idea to see what, what you know, people, how people feel about these kind of things. Um, and it kind of goes any end actually was kind of a nice one. It's like, do we want to do it in kernel or do we want to do it in user space? Uh, the experience we have here at, at Google is more that uh, use, uh, user space is um, a better place to, to um, implement policy and change policy uh, because we see a variety of application and we see one policy works well for a group of application, another policy gonna work well for another group of application. And it's much easier if we can have like, you know, like kind of a C group uh, ID or like uh, like that, and have different policy for different group of application, and it's really um, uh, usually easier to also try different policy inside user space than it is to uh, embed the kernel. Um, so you know, um, I'm not saying we should disable all the kernel, uh, you know, like Autonuma or stuff like that, um, but usually it's kind of thing we do. We disable them and we try to do stuff inside user space. Um, but I still value, you know, like. The LRU list, the multi generation, all you just think very the talk after that. Um, you know, I still believe some of the kernel mechanisms do make sense and they need to be augmented with memory tiering. So I don't know how people feel about that, this split between user space versus kernel space. I guess I'm like asking questions so that like <laughs> trying to gather consensus here. Um, well, user, user space, less. <laughs> so, so one one of the ways we've talked we, we we've talked about sometimes on using this kind of thing is that maybe that you 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 offer this as your as your data center service that um, if if you have a bronze tier VM then always, then everything gets put in in sort of slow memory and the gold level VM always gets put into the hot zone and, and you differentiate that way and this is how you use it. It's, it's it's not going to be a solution for everything, but it's one way to use this kind of memory. Yeah, it's, an, it's a very easy way, that's true. So if you have multiple tier of memory, you can sell the lower tier at the lower price. Um, but, you know, like I say, there is also the, the thing is that even for high tier application, uh, they have a large chunk, we see many applications with large chunk of memory that is cold. And just a waste of memory, really. Um, and, and as efficiently as possible. I, th I think actually our, our, our uh, goal is, is to extract the maximum amount of money from the people who are renting our house. <laughs> <laughs> well, and as for your question here, I mean, I, I think we can all agree that we're not gonna have one answer to these things. Like it obviously can't just be in the kernel, right? Um, we're gonna have people that will be fine with the kernel solution because they wanna write dumb applications that don't know anything. We're also gonna have the really smart folks who know how to do exactly what they want, set their whole app up and just say kernel hands off, you don't know what you're doing. So, I mean, both will exist and maybe even on the same machines, so. Yeah, and I, I, you know, like I say, I think I don't want them to step on over each other toe, basically. So you want to make sure that, you know, they don't conflict um, and one undo the, what the user is doing, which is kind of a big issue. Um, so, but Barata has a comment uh, regarding page migration. If the platform, say by a DMA engine, can accelerate page moves uh, between tiers, can we have migration APIs that can hand over the migration to its driver, DMA engine driver, perhaps? Is there such a migration API already? So I think the DMA is not the big issue when it comes to page migration. It's more like unmapping the page, doing all the answering metadata stuff. It's it's a bit more on like, that's what we've seen so far. Yeah, there's some fancy memory moving accelerators. Be like, hey, this will work for page migration. And yes, it will, but exactly. All the software overhead to get everything done before you can move it in the hardware is the big problem. The hardware doesn't help much. Yeah, and, and versus solutions, so I don't, yeah, what date are we actually? The 12, yeah. Okay, so I cannot talk. But like, where is our solution about page migration um, coming from multiple vendor? Um, so, um, but yeah, so, so it's, right now the DMA is not the big issue. It's, it's worth noting that anytime you've got code that deals with pages and, this, and also the data within those pages, we lose a lot of performance by blowing away our caches and then looking at pages. We really wanna vectorize those, all of those APIs and if we do that, then it's much easier to make use of hardware offload. I'll say one more thing. There have been hardware designs as well that try to do essentially memory migration in hardware, right? There's something called uh, two-level memory that Intel had that moved stuff between DRAM and the Optane, which is the memory stuff. It sounds like a really good idea and it gets software out of the business of moving stuff, but it loses a bunch of capacity and the hardware was just, it, 
it didn't work very well for a lot of people. It was great for some people, but not everybody loved it. So we're, we're, into the, we're into the lunch break. You don't have to stop talking, <laughs> but we do have a coffee break right now, and the other microconferences are letting out and are eating our snacks. So, <laughs> well, thank you for like the discussion. That's really what I wanted. <laughs> See you all back here in fifteen minutes. Fifteen.
Hey, Jesse. Can you hear me? What? Hello? Yes. Ah, uh, yes, I can hear so, you. Uh, I, I don't think they can hear us. Nice. Is it working? I can see you. Hello? Uh, I, I don't think they can hear us. That is rather unfortunate. <laughs> uh, JC uh, is still working on it. Uh, hopefully he can fix it in time. Oh boy.
I wonder if we're wonder showing up on the big screen in the room. What? What? Hold on, there, there's an echo. How do I fix this? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, echo is good. Echo means your voice is coming out from the main room. Why don't we, why don't we hear them? Yeah, Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Hello? Oh. Hello? Hello? Oh. Yes, I can hear you. There's still echo. So ah uh, yes, in that case the echo might be caused by the room itself. Why don't we call no, uh, we can't hear you guys, Jesse. New text seem to start presenting. Oh, okay, it's working. All right, so as expected, uh, a few audio <laughs> issues we can have to present remotely. Um, he may or may not be able to hear us throughout this. I'll do my best to relay any questions. Um, so, uh, yeah, so take it away, you. All right. So let's move on to the current status of MJRU. Uh, here, um, so we have a uh, uh, patch set 14 currently uh, being tested in Linux Next. Uh, patch set uh, 15 um, is expected to be in uh, 6.1. And we have uh, eight downstream, downstream kernels that have been carrying the patch set. And uh, we have uh, um, two additional uh, backports working in progress uh, for Raspberry Pi and WSL2. Uh, those are uh, uh, 515 kernels. 
And also uh, we have posted uh, eight server benchmarks and uh, there are two more working in progress. And we are working on uh, JavaScript and JVM benchmarks. Next page. And the next step, um, we plan to uh, make the uh, MGRU default. Uh, currently, it, it is default in all Chromebooks, and it, it will not be the default uh, key, fun, key config when the lands in 6.1. Uh, also, uh, MGRU comes with uh, an efficient page table scanning mechanism. It can help uh, detect empty page tables so that they can be freed. Also, it can help detect TGPs with high internal fragmentation so that it can be split. So I'll uh, touch on the details later. And also, uh, we are working on integrating MGRU with eBPF. Um, basically, MGRU itself, the uh, core algorithm, it's aimed to be simple. Also, um, the entire framework, it tries to be flexible. So its design leaves uh, complex heuristics and special use cases to eBPF. And um, the, uh, those eBPF programs can obtain page access information from MGRU. Also, uh, those programs can override the default generation assignment. That is uh, it, uh, assigning different hard code pages to different young old generations based on use cases, uh, based on different use cases or uh, additional hints from user space. So we will have the uh, demo later. So um, how to make the uh, MGRU default? Uh, there are two major obstacles. The first one is uh, free, free bits and paid flags. And uh, currently, uh, MGRU requires three additional bits in page flags to store generation number for each page. And on 64 bit CPUs, this is not a big problem because uh, there are usually plenty of free bits. But on 32 bit CPUs, uh, some build configurations may not have enough bits. Uh, left for MGRU. So we want to uh, free some existing bits to make room for MGRU. So the current plan is to move RRU related bits into the lower bits of PGRU pointers. Basically, we have uh, uh, two uh, pointers in the uh, link list node, in the RRU link list node. So uh, the lower bits are not used. So we can uh, fit some uh, MGRU related bits there. Uh, specifically, we want to move page active, page unevictable, and page swap back into lower, lower into uh, the uh, pointers. Uh, those bits they are on, they are not modified when uh, a page is on IRU list. So it's it is safe to use. Uh, uh, the lower bits of the uh, RLU uh, link list node. Once this is done, uh, we can um, turn on, we can make the MGRU the default for all CPU architectures without breaking any build configurations. So uh, also the uh, second uh, major obstacle is uh, limited performance tax coverage on page reclaim. Uh, many regressions usually uh, were reported only after they had hit the uh, production systems. So uh, we want to minimize the negative impacts on end users. So we have to uh, proactively identify regressions. So to do this, we need uh, a lot more test coverage. So currently, the uh, uh, test coverage that is available to us is, is far from uh, being enough. So uh, a minor concern here is like uh, is the uh, code health. So we need to uh, uh, refactor the uh, MGRU code into a new file, probably, and probably gonna adapt the uh, slab 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 mode uh, a model. We have different uh, files for different RUs, and uh, 
um, also uh, we want to turn on, uh, we want to turn off, turn off the existing RU. If you want to, only want to use MGRU, there's there no point to uh, build the uh, existing RU. So um, the stability is not an issue because uh, MGRU has been proven in our production system. So uh, also there are uh, uh, many distros have been carrying the MGRU patch set. So um, it's proven very stable and they're having memory pressure. So uh, as I mentioned before, MGRU comes with an efficient page table scanning mechanism. So we want to read. Um, so uh, basically, it, MGRU scans page tables to clear the access bit. And this, this is highly optimized. Uh, for example, it tracks whether a process has been sleeping and uh, it skips those that have because um, if a process has been sleeping, they can't access memory. So it also has a built-in bloom filters um, to filter out uninteresting page tables. Uh, for example, uh, if we have a page table populated with code pages, and there, there, uh, there's no point to scan it if we are if we are only interested in hard pages. So it also uses um, the uh, access bit in non-leaf page table entries. So this is currently only supported on x86, and uh, with the, the that uh, with the uh, that access bit, we can uh, it can narrow down the search space when um, when working page tables. So basically, this page table scanning mechanism can be reused for multiple purposes. And the first potential use case here is to detect empty page tables. And uh, um, generally, um, unused page tables can cause a fortune. And this was discussed um, during the, uh, uh, the last LS LSFMM in May this year. And there, there's also uh, an LW article on uh, this it captures all the details. So we won't go, to, go into these details. And uh, here, I think uh, a uh, producer consumer model may materialize this idea. Basically, uh, we want uh, the MGR, MGR page table scanning is the producer. And it works on different processes one by one. And when uh, it finds an empty page table from a process, it enqueues this empty page table. And then the consumer can be dedicated thread and it dequeues the empty page tables belonging to the same process and free them in few large benches. So uh, here I, I, I need to uh, emphasize on um, the um, process. This is a per process. Uh, the the, uh, the queues are per process so that we don't have to uh, take M matlock for write for, for, uh, to free each page, empty page tables because otherwise it's gonna cause the uh, M, -lock table, uh, M, -map, M map lock contention. Next page. Also, uh, we can leverage the page table scanning uh, to detect THP internal fragmentation. Uh, the THP internal fragmentation is, is a long-standing problem and it often causes capacity loss without the noticing because uh, kernel generally has no knowledge of how well user space uses, uh, utilizes uh, THPs. Also, uh, THP is not suitable for clients like Chrome OS or Android, mainly because of the internal fragmentation. And also, uh, during uh, the uh, MGRU uh, benchmarking, we found that uh, THP internal fragmentation uh, had a uh, very bad negative uh, effect on several applications like Memcached and Redis because uh, those uh, 
Kiwi in memory Kiwi stores, they use the smaller projects on, on average. The object size they use is like 700 uh, bytes. So giving them TTP is basically uh, with lots of space. So uh, the worst case scenario here is like uh, access is to a single 4K page, base page, uh, would make an entire TTP seem um, really hot. And uh, since now this entire, this TTP only has one access bit and this shields the rest of uh, five, 11 pages from page reclaim. So uh, those five, 11 pages might not uh, have been used at all. So uh, basically, uh, MJR page table scanning can help detect HPs with um, specifically this scenario. So uh, for example, if we have a HP and um, when, we, uh, when the system is under memory pressure and MGRU page table scanning can periodically swaps the PFD mapping of this PHP with 5 12 consecutive PDEs. And uh, this, uh, this 5 12 consecutive PDEs, this is a special mode. So it's still considered collapsed, it's, it's not the uh, split mode. Yes, question? Yep, okay. Uh, have you seen the patches from um, Alex at Facebook that uh, are, he, he has a, a, a THP scanner that scans, he, he's, he's, he's only doing it for anonymous pages right now, and what he does is he scans to see which are entirely zero. And that's not giving you a hot cold, but it is giving you a never used versus uh, sometimes used. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have, yeah, I have replied to that thread. So basically with uh, five, 12 consecutive PDEs, uh, we can not only detect internal fragmentation, we also can detect the uh, utilization. So that means uh, if we have TGP and the zero space only uses the first, page, first base page, then um, the uh, rest of uh, five to 11 access bits won't be set. So based on this information, we don't need to scan anything or we don't need to really uh, look into uh, the, the content of those pages. Does it make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thanks. So, uh, where, oh, where was I? Okay, uh, yes, here. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, there, there was a concern here um, about um, um, TLB misses because uh, some hardware also offer something called TLB coalescing. So uh, if we map consecutive PDEs, uh, if we use consecutive PDEs to map consecutive physical pages, the hardware can collapse multiple PDEs into a single one, sorry multiple TLB entries into a single one. So this currently is supported on uh, AMD, then two and I think ARM, newer ARMs, uh, ARM V8.2 uh, and later. So uh, once the, we can de detect the uh, internal fragmentation of, the th of this THP, and we can determine whether to protect it from page reclaim, Right. If this TGP has uh, you know, appears to be really hot, but it has a high internal fragmentation, we can stop protecting it. Right. We can just ignore the access bit because we know that the access bit only reflects you know, the, the accesses on, on, on a few um, base pages, not at the entire TGP. So then uh, page reclaim is gonna split this TGP and evict the code pages. And, uh, but leave the hot pages in place. If the utilization is high, we can just swap those 512 consecutive TTEs back with the original PMD. So we don't have to take the, we don't need to take the uh, MM block for write because previously we said um, the uh, 512 consecutive PTE mode is considered a collapsed mode. It's not the sweet mode.
Oh, okay, I have I missed two more things here. So additional ideas to leverage the uh, page table scanning um, include probably um, to improve new balance by detecting uh, misplaced uh, new pages. Also, uh, and might be able to speed up the KHPHD page D by detect hard PTE tables. Uh, one comment or one question. So I think like the, the foundation of what you described here is that we can actually recollapse a TAP, THP once it was mapped via PTEs, correct? Um, yes. I think like having that might be beneficial either way. So did, did we consider implementing collapse of transparent huge pages that have been PTE mapped? just to remap them into a THP. Because right now, what we would always do is we would allocate a new transparent huge pages. We would migrate everything over and essentially throw the old PTE map transparent huge page away. So I was wondering if it would make sense to just start with that and then play with all of the other approaches of like temporarily remapping something, uh, which is obviously uh, more involved, I would say. <laughs> Yeah, and one yes. other question there. Um, were you proposing here that we actually do a split and collapse here, or just that we do some page table magic underneath the covers to just put a special page table entry there? Uh, the latter. Okay. Because basically, this 512 consecutive PDE is going to be a new mode. It, it's not the uh, split mode. It's not, it's, not, it's not equivalent to the existing split mode. Because if, if we consider if we consider this uh, 512 consecutive PDE the speed mode, then we would have to um, take a map lock for right when we collapse it. We, when we swap, yeah. we swap it back with the original PDE, PMD entry. That sounds very interesting in theory because you're right, it would take kind of all of the software conversion and out of the picture. But we have a lot of code that does like if you know, PMD huge, right? It goes and looks for, is the hardware large page bit set? So has anybody looked into this? Is this is this hard or is this just a matter of adding a little more handling to these pages? This is hard. It's gonna be I'm, the I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Go ahead. I'm, I'm not sure why, why we're talking about this as a new mode. I, th I thought we already distinguished between splitting a PMD and splitting a page. No, but I, I think, do we? I mean. Well, yeah, because you 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 leave a, a THP alone in in the page cache, right? You, you don't split a page in the page cache just because one of its users has decided to unmap part of it. Anonymous memory is a little bit different because sometimes you want to, if you're splitting it, you want to either put it on the um, the the deferred free list or you want to just split it straight away. But yeah, I mean, we 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 definitely have like the the gut for split mode, which only splits the PMD. It doesn't split the the page itself. I guess we do have that now where we separate out the page table mapping from the, that's a, that's a good point. Okay, uh, that's, I'm gonna, uh, like go, go ahead. Split a, split a PMD, we never collapse it back. So in order to recollapse, you need a fresh transparent huge page. And that seems like a reasonable optimization on its own, I think. I, so, I so, think yes, there, yes, there, there, there are two uh, overhead um, there. The first one is like we have to, when we collapse uh, a uh, small page into THP, we have to take a map uh, log for write. And the second one, we have to do it, uh, we have to migrate the uh, small pages, even they are consecutive physical pages to a new THP. Yeah, but so we want I to don't avoid think that you, that you would need um, a map log when you recollapse the same page that's mapped. You're not replacing it with a different THP, you're just changing the mapping. I, I think we could get away without the map log in write mode. Yeah, we, we uh, can. We can, get, we can get away um, with both, with both the uh, map lock right and the migration. Just wanted to say that the initial reason I think for the splitting of page tables and the PHP itself was disconnected is because splitting of uh, in the page tables cannot ever block. Uh, while the splitting of page can, so it can be, it's different, so to mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, 
I'm gonna have to re uh, skip part of uh, this um, presentation. It's, it's unfortunate that you know uh, the audio didn't work at the very beginning. So I'm gonna hand it over to Yuan Chu. He's gonna uh, talk about the BPF part. Yuan Chu, you're muted. Ah, yes, the classic problem. Uh, okay, let me see how this controls thing work. Um, I can move on to the next slide. Okay, cool. So I have a quick demo to show that I can add um, BPF support to MGLRU page table walks to obtain a per process heat map. Um, I think my control, okay, cool. Uh, I, I, so, I was controlling for you. So uh, did you see the uh, plus button on, on, on the uh, right, on the left? Bottom. Yes. Okay. Just okay. Back. Can I click this? I don't think the animation is showing up here. Because this is a video and I'm trying to play it. Anyways, I uh, I whipped up a quick demo of uh, of this heat map tool capturing the the heat of a mem tier memcached benchmark. Um yeah, yes, question? So most lakes are visible. You may have to share your screen of the video from the uh, the slide deck instead of the PDF for the video. Oh, this is a PDF. No, uh, I think, oh, oh yeah, right, this is a PDF. But I think there's a link, this is a PDF file. If you click the link, I'm not sure what's gonna happen. So while he brings that up, I realized we didn't introduce uh, MGLRU at all. So I guess some of you were at LSFMM and it was discussed there. But the, uh, the kind of high level is that we were motivated to reduce the overhead of page table scan or page scanning and um, also improve the decisions we make about which uh, pages to kick out. Um, so Yu Zhao came up with MGLRU um, and it has done both of those things. And in a very literal sense, the numbers that we've seen so far are kind of incredible. It's across the board, we see really massive improvements um, in CPU overhead and, uh, and we're picking the right pages to evict. And so on Chrome OS, that translates to more tabs available or more tabs open um, and lower tab switch times and just better behavior overall if, we, if we're running multiple VMs like Android uh, alongside Chrome OS. Um, so it's been a really great, Thing. Uh, all of the server benchmarks have also been um, pretty positive. Uh, so far, we haven't found use cases that you know expose pathological behavior. So, if you haven't tried it yet, I encourage you to try it. It's queued in Andrew's MM tree um, for 6.1. So, if you pull down his tree, um, you can check out the documentation and code, um, and it should improve. You know, even local stuff like build times. Any luck, you want to on the? Here we go. Is it working? Yeah. Yes. Yep. I see it. Okay. Yeah. So I whipped up a quick demo showing uh, showing the heat map tool capturing a memcache benchmark. It's going to. So I'm just showing uh, how I'm getting the. Yeah. So it's a standard DB installation. So the benchmark first tries to populate linearly the uh, a bunch of keys, and then it does a, a Gaussian access on all of the keys. Yeah, so this tool actually supports uh, configurable aging intervals and aggregation intervals and through BPF is able to hook into the MGLRU page table, uh, page table walks and uh, get all the access information out of there. Um, it's also triggering the MGLRU aging with uh, BPF as well. So that's kind of cool, driven by user space. Oh, and I sped up this, uh, this video because it would take a very long time otherwise. You know, in, now that we're running short on time, I'm kind of glad we did that. <laughs> yep. 
Yeah, this is a very still very rough proof of concept, but you, you can see that it, it has pretty good potential. And I uh, I just posted this yesterday on LKML, still relatively new to the uh, contributing. So fun time. Yes, uh, I would like to add that this is uh, only the first step. So uh, we. We plan to introduce uh, eBPF programs to um, additional um, memory management components like NUMA balancing and the Hilt pages. Because uh, we just felt like um, there, there are a lot of heuristics and uh, we could move into eBPF. And also uh, eBPF programs can help uh, improve uh, many special use cases. Yeah, so this is a quick visualization. There are other modes other than displaying the heat. You can also show the NUMA node of each uh, each region and show whether a whether the region is uh, mostly anon pages or other any or other um, like like you said. Um, page access information can also be used to inform the MGLRU page generation placement. So right now the generation, when when the page is accessed through page tables, it's automatically promoted to the youngest generation, but that's not necessarily the best thing to do. And having page, having a uh, page access information will help the user space make better decisions. I will stop and sharing. Matthew's Tab. telling me it's time to move on to the next speaker. Um, but thanks a lot, you guys. I'm glad we were able to get this through. So please follow up with, with these guys on the mailing list or on the Matrix chat if you have specific questions. Um, and looking forward to seeing this land. Thanks, everyone. Again? So can you just paste for us? Absolutely. I'm going to check that my slides have been uploaded. Yeah, there they are. Look at that. <clears throat> All right. Should I get going? Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm James. I'm a kernel and hypervisor engineer for Amazon EC2. And today I'd like to have the discussion around the topic of memory management of virtual machines and live updates. That is the ability to boot into a new kernel via KExec, restart um, all new versions of user space processes while um, preserving and restoring the state of the running virtual machines after KExec, after live update. Specifically here, the focus will be on the memory management aspect. Um, that's kind of part of the discussion that, uh, part of the discussion, I'm gonna introduce this concept of Muse memory management in user space as a file system, which should hopefully provide some of the memory management capabilities we need to be able to support live update. So roughly what we'll be looking at is just an overview of what live update involves and some of, would involve in some of the uh, memory management requirements and then look at some ways we could, some possible options for solving it, a specifically a fully in-kernel managed approach or a user space managed approach, and then go into some details about how that um, suggested file system in user space with memory management controls could work to support li um, live updates. So live update essentially involve, would involve um, serializing existing running virtual machines, pausing the vCPUs, k-execing into a new kernel, starting up new user space VMM processes, like a new version of QMU or that kind of thing, deserializing your vCPUs and then resuming them running from where they left off. So the same guest instruction pointer values, same guest registers, all that sort of thing. And the requirements here are that we need to persist guest memory and state across this process so that it's able to resume from where it left off. This isn't exactly snapshot and restore, and the reason is that we actually want to start a new 
user-space binary new version of QMU, which potentially structures things slightly differently. Um, it's just that virtual machine state that we want to um, persist. So just to get a feel for some of the memory requirements, trying to get a bit of a flavor for what could be involved here, the basic case would be we want to allocate a virtual machine with a chunk of memory. Maybe you want to give it eight gigabytes of RAM, pre-allocate all of that memory, and then after live update, be able to restore that same memory to the virtual machine. It should also be possible to do things like memory over subscription. So dynamically mapping and unmapping pages uh, on demand as needed, including potentially host swap and um, making that swap state survive across live update as well. Um, and also delivering faults to user space for things like migration, um, potentially um, keeping IOMMU page tables persisted so that any in-flight DMA can continue across this live update, um, potentially slicing up MMIO regions and even carving out portions of memory from an existing virtual machine to spawn a new sidecar virtual machine. So yeah, I just wanted to kind of give a flavor of some of the potential intricacies and complexities that are necessary in memory management to provide a sort of comprehensive um, virtualization solution. So yeah, there's a lot of dynamicism here and whatever we sort of look at to solve the problem needs to be able to cater for these sort of techniques. Broadly, I think there are two ways that we could do this. The one would be a fully in-kernel um, managed solution where the kernel would construct all of the state using traditional allocators and then pass it from the old kernel to the new kernel uh, as part of the k-exec process. Um, something like PKRAM, which was an RFC, was proposed for this sort of topic. Oh, sorry, you just be clarified, you, you're talking about the guest kernel here rather than the host kernel. I'm talking about the host kernel. So, so, so um, k-exec, this live update process, is about you want to update your hypervisor. You want to update to a new version of your Linux hypervisor kernel plus new VMM processes like a new QMU, for example. And the whole point here is you want this to actually be as transparent as possible to the guests. So aside from a short blip in um, execution time when this update process is happening, it should, it should be frozen and then resume from exactly where it left off and almost not notice that your hypervisor has updated. That is the live update process. I uh, have a question. Um, what is the reason behind updating the QMU as well at the same time when you do the kernel upgrade um, as opposed to just you know upgrading k-exec your kernel and then using uh, QMU upgrade processes? Hmm, that's a, I guess it's a reasonable question. Um, I think we've just been looking at your, your kernel and your user space processes as kind of your hypervisor in one package. And you want to be able to go from old version of hypervisor, which is combination of kernel and user space, to new version as a kind of atomic update. But I guess a, another reasonable approach would be to think of these as separate operations. I'm not sure if that is necessarily better or worse as opposed to just i think it's free go. like once you update kernel uh it's free to also update the qmu yeah or any other i mean the reason for doing this in the first place is bugs right kernel has bugs qmu has bugs you want to update both yeah i think the no. question was do you need to do them together in one go yeah why bundle it you know now we do because otherwise we'd have to store all the kvm and vcpu state in the kernel in order that QMU or the VMM can keep running, right? Yeah. As it is, we serialize all the state as if for live migration, and then we yeah. k-exec into the new kernel and resume that state from memory, from the memory that is being persistent. Mm. That's why we're here. But at least QMU is then essentially doing a resume, a live migration resume. It's just live right. migration in time instead of space, right? It's not going to a different box. Right. But if you want to talk about the vCPUs persisting in kernel state such that QMU is still attached to the magically via existing file descriptors, that's a lot harder, right? We're not talking about keeping no, not talking about checkpoint restore and keeping mm. existing user space processes running in the next kernel at all, right? There, I did read about some prior art for QMU live updating, where you keep the same kernel and you go from old QMU to new QMU. So that is a potential approach to decouple them. 
but then you're still left with the kernel update process. Sure, so you kind of, yeah. And that's the same thing, right? That is serialized state and then resume, as if you've done a live migration. It's just that you're right. you know, showing a new version of QME. Yeah. yeah. I think the trick there is that you want to maintain your kernel memory when upgrading, uh, your, your VM memory when upgrading QME is that you just use shared memory as a file, like a file back shared memory, and you just give it a new VM and you restore everything else, but the VM, mem VM memory essentially gets... Uh, yeah. So, the so file... upgrading QMU is easy. Um, like upgrading your kernel is the hard part, I guess. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. So you mentioned fileback memory, which is kind of where I'm going with this, but you need that fileback memory to survive across this K exec process. So you can't use something like traditional tempfs or something like that. But on that topic, that's what this PK RAM thing suggests, um, proposal suggested, which is basically like tempfs but with persistence. And ex other state like IOMMU page tables and all that stuff could also potentially be passed from old kernel to new kernel. Zen does this through using breadcrumbs. Um, and the advantage of an approach that's fully kernel managed is it's probably faster than the other option, which is the user space control. But I think it's a lot more complex to get something like PKRAM right and to get all the state handed over from old kernel to new kernel and re-plugged into the correct places when your new user space processes start up. I think it becomes very complicated. So the other option here is to have this, uh, your state re-driven into your new kernel um, after uh, k-exec by user space and basically make user space uh, in control of a lot of the things that you need to persist. And so, yeah, the suggestion here is basically around providing a file system type interface which is backed by non-kernel um, managed memory. So it's backed by what you can call persistent memory, memory that's, um, out, that's outside of the kernel allocators, which is where we can put everything that we need to survive across k-exec versus your what I'll we'll call ephemeral memory, that's what's managed by the kernel. And um, that get all the ephemeral memory gets recreated and restarted um, after your k-exec and your new processes start up. Okay, so I'm suggest we're suggesting a file system type approach here where user space would be able to program all of the necessary mappings and configuration and all that sort of thing into this um, file system uh, from user space through IO controls and that sort of thing. And we could store arbitrary types of data in here. We could store some files for guest memory, some for some KVM state, some for page tables, all that kind of thing. Um, so is this just a traditional file system on top of something like DAX? Like, can you just use ext4 on top of a DAX device? I think that's, that would become challenging to try and use a traditional file system, especially to try and expose those, the semantics around some of those more complicated or exotic things that I mentioned, like slicing up PCI bars or memory over commit with swap. Those are sort of things that would be really difficult to expose in a traditional file system and similarly like page tables and that sort of thing. So I would suggest a new sort of file system that is designed with this use case in mind, specifically storing states that uh, needs to be rehydrated possibly into the kernel like page tables um, across KXF. So this idea was floated at LSFMM earlier this year and we got some feedback there that said that this user space approach does seem preferable rather than trying to build the complexity into the kernel. So based on that feedback, I'm kind of looking at um, expanding on the concept a bit now um, and trying to get uh, yeah, a, a more like fleshed out idea. So where am I? Yeah, th that's some of the justification. I think I've mentioned that already. Um, Avoiding complexity, giving user space the ability to have policy and to evolve kind of independently. Kernel provides mechanism, user space provides policy and actually sets everything up and restores it after a uh, live update. So I think I've kind of hinted at this already, but this is roughly the suggestion. So you carve out a large chunk of your host memory um, from to not be kernel managed through something like an MMAP command line parameter. And that is then your persistent memory. I've labeled it guest memory, but your persistent memory and everything else that's not 
carved out is your ephemeral memory managed by the kernel. You could then um, mount a mount this Muse file system, memory management and user space file system, and set it to have a be backed by this memory which you've carved out from the kernel. And that would then allow you to, well, you as in user space to program mappings from files into PFNs from that uh, guest memory. And there would essentially be a concept of a control process here, which is your memory management and user space control that would be responsible for creating the files, programming in mappings, deciding which client process, like which QMU gets what memory, and then imp importantly, re-driving that into the kernel after kexec so that these files get the same mappings as they had before. I Your have client a question about uh, this uh, partitioning. Uh, so, as I understand, the partitioning can be done using uh, the uh, emulated persistent memory, but uh, my question is, uh, at the beginning you mentioned the overcommit uh, as one of the problems that needs to be solved. Hmm. Uh, so how overcommit can be solved is if guest memory is not managed by kernel. Is it like completely managed by user space? Sure. So what you could do is treat a large portion of that persistent memory block as a communal pool almost. And your control process could get faults when a guest accesses memory that it hasn't accessed before. And then in response to that fault, your, your control process could program in a new mapping to a file that says that faulting address is now backed by this PFN from that pool. So your control process would act as an allocator responsible for driving mappings into the kernel. And it would then, the important thing is it would need to redrive those mappings in after live update, or they would need to be persisted across KXX. So basically, uh, com completely manage uh, the uh, guest VM memory in the user space, of course. That's right. Yeah. So you, the user space component would be responsible for making these mapping decisions and be able to replay those mappings after K execs. All the kernel ephemeral mappings are lost, and only the important ones for actual that you need to preserve, like guest memory mappings, would be persistent. No swapping support then. Say again? No swap support. You could absolutely have swap support here. So one, the way you could do something like that is your user space control process could decide to swap out some memory and it could write it off to somewhere else and then it could record in its own internal state that, mem that memory from that file is now somewhere else. It, and it sounds like it's re-implementation everything that the kernel already has. It's not, I wouldn't say it's everything. I mean, kernel management is, ex is you know, there's a lot of complexity. No, no, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, memory allocation and swapping. There, I mean, there is definitely overlap with kernel memory allocations and swap in path and all that sort of thing. But the idea is to separate what we need to be persistent. Um, those mappings need to be persisted across KExec. The other ones for like your traditional anonymous memory space for processes don't. Yeah. But that is, I mean, why I kind of said they are like two ways of doing it, where you could get your kernel allocator to be fully responsible, but then you need to pass over all that state, all those mappings, all that swap information, and that's where I think the real complexity of this comes. What I was thinking is like uh, to allow uh, leverage kernel uh, allocator mm. to still use this guest memory, so basically, but not for anything else except for like the guest memory. So, uh, just, uh, so like the first partition is the general purpose kernel memory and the rest is uh, like, like only a, a guest memory allocation but still managed by kernel. Right, but so I it, think... it would be a new type of persistent memory for kernels basically, yeah. a new device. I think that the, that is definitely an, an approach but I think the complexity starts coming in of how do you pass those mappings across? How do you pass all those allocations, things like what has been swapped out where um, from old kernel to new kernel? Don't you end up implementing something like breadcrumbs? Where are your, yeah. Any thoughts, David? The breadcrumb thing works in Zen 
the way that happens is that you need to give a boot allocation um, to the new zone, to the new mm -hmm. kernel, right? So the breadcrumb ends up um, sort of giving you access to a list of the pages that are already in use, and that yeah. contains a data stream which you can format how you like, right? And it can include all that metadata to tell you what goes where, mm -hmm. right? So we can have page tables, and ultimately you just have a your main stream can have a pointer to the root of page tables from which you can find everything else, mm -hmm. right? And then the buddy allocator only ever gets given the pages that aren't already in use, right? And that's how you populate the rest of memory. And then all these pages that have been allocated and persisted, well, when they eventually get free, if they eventually get freed, well, they just get freed and they, everything just works out perfectly. But you need a certain amount of memory for the kernel to start using an early boot. And so you have to have a separate zone of memory from which thou shalt never allocate anything you want to persist, right? Yeah. So, and that's easy enough, right? Certain allocations can come from that boot mem because we know that those are never going to be persisted to the yeah. next. It's easy enough in Zen, certainly. We want to achieve that. Uh, I think just coming back to the, the question of, you know, should we be using the existing kernel allocated? I, well, I, I haven't attempted to prototype that, but I think it, I can imagine it gets really complicated when you need your allocators to sometimes allocate from this like persistent memory pool and sometimes from ephemeral pools and trying to get the kernel allocators to know about these different pools of memory and pass that state across. I, I mean, like the, 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 the thing I didn't like about uh, peak KRAM was that it was doing exactly that. It was like that the system had available, let's say, eight, giga, eight gigabytes of memory, and then you pass something to boot and said, yeah, well, leave that out, leave that out, leave that out. That's just the ugly way of doing that. I, I yeah. agree with that. I also didn't like PKRAM because it was partition, like uh, you could get like a sparse list and then you have um, uh, implementation issue on the next boot. Yeah, yeah the, uh, we still can do yeah, the Exactly, and that, that's what I'm trying to say here is like, you now say like let's do it completely in user space why not do a sub, some kind of a split like you just have to set away a huge area of memory reserved for whatever purpose yeah. and you can pass it on there and maybe i'm daydreaming but i think there was a proposal on the memory management list recently how you can online the hot plug memory from from dax while keeping some of the pages already allocated not sure if that was from from one of you you guys working on that but it was essentially trying to do that like you would you would rip out a certain big portion of main memory and you would dedicate that completely to some kind of kernel file system that would handle the bootstrapping of the boot like picking out what is actually located in the file system which blocks and then it would simply go ahead and free back all of the free memory in that area back to the body allocator. The only thing you would have to teach the system is then that you you have some kind of these files, they're only allowed to allocate from this certain memory region. And you could either do that by a fake NUMA node or some additional zone in the body allocator that is not getting used to anything else. But I think you could repurpose most of the infrastructure. The only thing where it gets difficult is swapping, but I'm not sure if you should be worrying about that at this point because it makes the whole thing so much more complicated. If you have like, then again, you have a swap device, kernel comes up, tries to reuse it. So you have to steal back again, all of these like individual bits and pieces. So then yeah. you might want to implement swapping in user space if it's possible to some degree. But I, I think, yeah, I, I agree with uh, basically everything you're saying, you know, and when you try to do these more um, advanced memory management things, you know, I think the trying to do it in the kernel and, pers and persist that and pass that across is going to start creaking pretty soon. If you want to do simple things like I want to allocate a page, but you know, what about things like you want to allocate gigabyte pages instead of 4K pages? You want to choose, oh, I'm going to allocate large chunks of memory to improve TLB performance and all that sort of thing. And that's kind of, am I being, what's, how's the time situation? Zero, minus, one. minus one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, in that case, I'll end off. Um, thanks for the discussion. I hope we can have some more discussions in the hallway. Thank you.
sad to report that this talk has been completely ruined because the airline lost my luggage that had my favorite Debian Anarchy shirt. They did call me at 3 a.m. to tell me that they found it, but I still don't have my shirt back. All right, so we're presenting on code tagging and memory allocation tracking. This is something that I've been wanting to get done for years. Uh, it's, the idea was stolen from the dynamic debug code, and then we subsequently used it out of tree for fault injection. Surin actually wrote most of the code for this, so I'm going to let him lead off. All right. Uh, how did I switch to the uh, meeting? Yes. Um, Matthew, was it end meeting or leave meeting to, to switch to the next one? To switch to the next one, is it? No, 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 don't, don't do either of those things. No, neither. So you want to go down here? Mike? Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, so, yeah. So, we'll present code tagging and some of the applications that we uh, prepared for this mechanism. And so, let's start with definition of code tagging. Is a very short description that I, the shortest description I could come up with is basically. It, it's a mechanism that allows us to statically allocate custom structures, which are associated with specific uh, locations in the code. Um, and uh, basically what that allows us is to, two major uh, benefits is that uh, storage for those structures are, uh, is allocated at compile time. Um, and the second one is that there's no lookup for that pointer. So whenever we need to update the, structure, the custom structure, we don't need to chase that pointer or do any kind of lookups. So that gives us basically a very fast access to, the, to it. In addition, it uh, records the location uh, where that structure was used and allocated. And it's also very easy to navigate between them because they are kind of allocated in one section. And that the data that we collect using this mechanism very efficiently. I can interject. So the, this is an old trick in the kernel of, we wouldn't need this in a language that had constructors because you would just write a constructor that has the object being constructed to some sort of global list or global data structure so you can find them afterwards. Uh, instead, what we do in the kernel, what has been done like half a dozen times is you declare all your, your static structs it's used for like bug info, uh, Ftrace uses a bunch. Uh, you put them in a special ELF section. Then you can just treat the ELF section as an array. Really slick, but then it gets complicated with modules. Uh, and so everyone's been open coding this. So we turned it into a library. All right, um, so let's go to the first application that We had for it. So uh, basically, the first application that we came up with, and that's how the whole idea started, was, was uh, mem memory allocation um, tracking. And um, so, what, what we did here is we instrumented the slab and page uh, uh, allocators um, in a way that we basically track the number of allocation and the allocations. So, whenever we allocate memory, we increment uh, a counter and the size in our custom structure, and whenever we deallocate, we decrement. So if uh, it's, it can be used for memory leak tracking, also can be used to find out uh, which locations in the code base are heavily used. So basically that can provide some information where we want to optimize things um, and which places are not that important. Um, so, yeah, to do that, we, we use, uh, for page allocations, we use page extension to record the pointer and to be able to. Let's take a step back and like describe at a high level what this is about. Okay. The next slide has that. Uh, 
I think what, how I'd really describe this is we've had profiling for years and years for CPU usage. It's easy to, to profile your program and see where, where is your CPU time going. What we've had uh, is profiling for memory usage. The closest thing that I know, know though that comes to this is TCMLOC, and it's not very easy to use. This it just shows up in debug fest, and it's cheaper to enable than MemCG. And so, but in addition to that, uh, in addition to that, when we uh, identify locations which might be leaking memory, for example, uh, that information, just a number of allocations and the overall size doesn't give us much to uh, fix that. So we also implemented the context capture support. So whenever we see some specific location is growing, let's say, or we see some abnormal uh, patterns there, we can enable context capture rule, which basically will capture us for us, uh, which process was allocating memory, uh, the timestamp, when it was done, and most importantly, call stack. Where was it called from? Uh, so that adds an overhead, but that overhead will be only for that particular location. We are not going to be uh, capturing all this data for all the locations, like, for example, page, ta uh, page owner does. In this case, we can selectively uh, choose which allocations we are more interested about and uh, dig into that, basically, uh, look at it much closer. Um, this provides us more information and hopefully enough information to chase the problems uh, when we see them. All right, uh, so I've done that kind of thing with the, the trace points. Uh, we ended up with issues at some point uh, with the compiler and linker uh, up aligning the structure. So if you have a structure alignment that is larger than your section alignment, you can end up with padding. So you cannot iterate that as an array when you have padding. Oh, you're, you're stashing a pointer allocation so that on, so you can, uh, don't stash the pointer with the object. We store it in the same area that MCG uses. Okay, so you basically, so you have an array of pointer to iterate on? Yeah. Okay, good, perfect, that's I what I did. I wanted to do it your way and certain the MCG people for, for alignment. Okay, good, perfect. And uh, the other question is that, that uh, section, is it kind of read-only or do you update it? Uh, the, the section with the, uh, the alloc tag, that's where we keep the statistics. So you update it? Yep. Yeah, it has so, to be read-writable because we, uh, we update it whenever that code so it's not per CPU, it's a global counter, right? Uh, actually, I wrote uh, lazy, lazy per CPU counters specifically for this. We don't have to burn per CPU uh, memory for per CPU counters in every allocation site. Some fancy code that starts out as an atomic counter and then back of the rate of updates and switches. Okay, because with this CPU ops, you could directly have per CPU counters and just have kind of read-only information in there to kind of track what you are keeping track of and keep the, the counters separate in per, per CPU memory. I, I don't see that memory. it necessarily matters whether the alloc tag itself is read, read right or not. For a reason, then. Yeah, it's, it's application specific. In, in case of memory tracking, we do need write access because we are updating those counters. Uh, but there could be some applications which need just a read only data. It, it also saves a pointer chase. Uh, so if there's no cache length, you're attempting to get a slow and the atomic counter can be faster. Oh, yeah, in this case, yes. Given you have the, the counter is in your section mm -hmm. already. Yeah, exactly. okay, thanks. All right. No more questions about this part. Let's turn to more applications. We've got a, f a couple other fun things. Uh, fault injection. Fault injection in the kernel, but it's a little bit limited compared to this. Uh, if you, anyone has looked at fail slab, you can specify, say, the, uh, the process ID that you want to fail slab allocations for, but you can't drill down to the exact 
call sites, as far as I know. This use the same hooks that we use for allocation tagging, and this gives you fault injection points for every KMLOC and alloc pages, et cetera, call. And you can switch them on and off on a file or line or module basis. It's dead easy to use. All you all you insert is this call to a dynamic fault. You don't have to have a separate dynamic fault. It goes up in debugging mess. And this is only like a couple hundred lines of code to implement too. Now that we've got proper libraries for this stuff, super exciting. You can see traffic, latent training is something that I've wanted for years and years and years. Back when I was at Google, we used to have a thing. Uh, I completely forgot the name of it, but it was used for tracking of latencies of BIOS all throughout the IO stack. It was a really brilliant idea. Unfortunately, the code was too terrible to live. That doesn't exist anymore as far as I know. And I'm hoping to regrow some of that functionality in a way that's sustainer. With this, we use the same idea of create these hooks that declare in the macro uh, an object that shows up in the debug event, but we, we use it for time stats. This time stats code comes from Bcache and Bcache FS. But data points that correspond to events that have a duration, and it generates a nice statistic for you. So what I did with this, I hooked, I instrumented every single wait event call in the kernel. Everything that uses the prepare to wait mechanism. And it all just shows up in debug event. Gives you count, rate, frequency, average duration, max duration, and quantiles. So we're going to be making some improvements to the that's called uh, yeah, this is adding standard deviation, weighted, and uh, normal standard deviation. The idea with this stuff is in, in contrast to trace points where you kind of have to uh, enable tracing and go looking for, uh, to start gathering information, I want something that's cheap and always on. I, a lot of times I'm debugging things where I'm interacting with a user over IRC or over internet, and I want, I want them to be able to get the information that I need as easily as possible. I also want that information to be collect, collected time so that it's already there when we run into something weird. This will be able to, when something weird happens, look through the, the collected latency information to see which events have current standard deviation or average that's wildly different from the historical since uh, the system has been up. But wait, there's more. <laughs> I'm saying, I've got a question. Okay. Uh, is there an option to to clear out the structure? You know, to it, because maybe you do want it from the dawn of time, but maybe sometimes you want to reset the data and then look at it some more. Not currently, but that would be pretty trivial. Then. Yeah, that would be a great yeah. idea to have. Yeah, uh, the time stats code is nice and small, easy to work with. I'm sure people could have fun coming up with new things to do with it. If if it's always on, how do you detect overflows, or is it like Overflow detection. Uh, everything is used to support. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, who has had to debug a problem where some code that you don't normally work with is returning enomam or enval single K, and the person who wrote the code did not add proper log messages? Thousands and thousands of lines of code to sift through. Hands. Yeah. Make your life easier. <laughs> what if we just had more error codes? What if we had a, a unique error code for every site in the kernel that throws an error? No, no. You, what, when your hand, you can put. Hmm. What if we had? a unique error code for every site in the kernel that throws an error. So this error macro does that, and it uses the code tagging thing to, behind the scenes, do the actual allocation. You pass it, say, enomem, and it returns you a unique error code. The really cool thing about this is then the error string, or error name, and the percent PE uh, printf extension, 
they then return you an error string that tells you the file and line number where that error came from. <laughs> and I think that's all the magic that I have to present today. Uh, questions? And can user space get that uh, information out from a, uh, after, say, a system call fails? Would user space be able to look up the uh, that error code? Because that sounds wonderful. So that the trouble with that is that it would be would then be returning. We'd have to return a new incompatible error code that existing user space code doesn't know about. If we can, I mean, we'd have to like rev the syscall interface somehow and pass that out of band. Uh, I would love to do that, though. I think it totally makes sense if we can figure out a not too complicated way to do it. I was talking to Julia Lal the other day at uh, the Rust conference. She says converting existing code to use a macro with Cochinelli would be totally straightforward. Uh, about this question, actually, for uh, reporting back to user space, we had some discussions at uh, Fisius uh, to do something like this. Uh, we did it for our internal projects, but we never got around to do it for the kernel. What worked all, uh, very well for us is to accumulate error codes in a stack. So, so as you are in a system call, you may be, so you start down at a very deep level, you have an error, and then it pops up, and then it can emit other errors. So, so every level of the stack may tell you something about what happened. Then you want that stack requeryable from user space to see, oh, from where did it fail and what happened at every level. That, that's a little bit trickier because then it gets into some kind of dynamic allocation. Or you could have, you could have a stack and like task struct that you've pre-allocated and that, that might work. Th this was like dirt simple. Some ideas about yeah. CBI that could be created for that. Yeah. The only real change to the kernel is uh, for that error code thing is we have to increase max error now, uh for pointer error. We end up having to reserve, I, I reserve like one megabyte at the top of the address space. I think, I think we can do that for better error codes. Uh... Mapping set error is the only thing that. Say, say again? Uh, mapping set er error, where the uh, struct address space gets an ERNO stuck in it. So generally it's either EIO or um, ENO space. But theoretically, we could have all 1,024 different errors put into it. I think we need to rework that mechanism. It, it, it was an improvement of what we had, but we. Anyway, you, can, you and I can talk about that offline. It's not a big deal. A general question just about the whole framework. Um, it seems, I like how easy it is, and I think the benefits are outweighing any any memory usage, but it does sound like it makes it so easy that you can have just all these ELS sections with all this extra static data. Is there like a tracking mechanism for it or just bloatometer, I guess? Would uh, yeah, since uh, any, any tool that shows you the size of your ELF sections. Another tool, another thing to go wild with. I was wondering, uh, uh, since, since you, uh, for the pages, you do the page X, which uh, currently means it's always uh, allocated. Uh, so one thing would be, of course, I, I think all, you already got the feedback that there should be a boot time enable option. So distros can uh, compile this and only use when they want to avoid uh, both the memory overhead and the runtime overhead. Right. But otherwise, yeah. Yeah, I think that's what we want actually feedback on. Uh, one of the feedbacks from RFC sounds like uh, one of the biggest things that we need to add is to, to be able to disable it. Um, right now, we, uh, we allow it to disable it from config <clears throat> when we basically at compile time. It sounds like we might need also to um, support that from kernel command line or maybe even at runtime. Uh, yeah, so yeah, the, the page X memory over it is currently just the boot time thing, but if you made it runtime, it would be. There's, there's two separate things, like page X versus maybe if this is useful enough, we could stick it in struct page. Option. Yeah, I was wondering whether you could do the same like with the slabs, like reuse the MCG field to 
point to something that stores both the MCG and the tag, whether the combination of those would be ultimately lower yeah. overhead than page. Yeah, for Slab, that what we are doing. We are sticking that point in the MCG data. And actually, we have a patch that makes that MCG data more generically used, usable. So you, we can extension. basically, right. So it's now it's called object extension, where MCG is just one thing that we can store there. Yeah. So okay. generally, I think it it opens up more opportunities in the future. Also, uh, yeah. And right now, the this whole um, mechanism is built so that we try to minimize the overhead uh, as much as possible, so that we can enable it in runtime in the production or pre-production testing. Uh, and right now, the biggest um, overhead is from like looking up the page extension, for example. So if we can um, find, uh, you know, uh, use some mechanism which minimizes even that, even further, that would be obviously would open up this mechanism to more applications. Page allocator is already pretty heavyweight compared to slab allocator. So I don't think the page extension is really killing us. <coughs> It's not that big as a fraction of the total allocation path. Slab, the slab fast path is way faster. That's where we really do want to be fast. So um, on, on the note of, I don't know, asking for more colors with this new tool, new tool um, what, what exactly do we need to enable in our kernel config to get access to like the line numbers and everything? I guess we need to debug info. So again, to get oh uh, the line numbers yeah oh that that uses uh, the file and line macros uh, debug info would get you like uh, function at the, the name of the function and then off, offset within the function which isn't as nice as file and line number file and line number does take up more space but it's a debugging tool yeah I was just wondering on um, uh, kernels users would most likely use if they're enabled uh, by default already, like the, the distro kernels. That, that's something that we could look at and then. Not how hard would it be to convince the, people to. There, there's also like past precedents. We're, we're just doing it the same way dynamic debug did using a file online number. And also turns out uh, you have to store the module string. Fortunately, these, these things get deduped by the linker in the, uh, in the tag structure because modules that are built in otherwise won't have access to that. Want the module name to be right, which we kind of do. Yeah. So it's they, these, they feel a little bit bigger than they ought to be, but it turns out there, there's good reasons for it, and I think it's, it's worth it. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to kind of point out uh, how much of this required, how much of this is stacked on top of the page extensions? I mean, without page extensions, does uh, all of it work or some of it or none of it? You are talking about some memory overhead or performance overhead? No, I mean, if page extensions is disabled, they configure boot time or whatever, um, how much of this is still working? Oh, um, yeah, memory allocation page, um, Page allocators would not be able to track the memory because you you need a pointer back to your allocated object so that you can incre decrement when it's freed. So you can and there are right now there are two separate right. configure options for page allocations and slab allocations. What about so you, say latency tracking? Does that work? Yeah, for, yeah. For that's what? completely separate from all of this. That'll work fine. With okay. Project. So I would yeah. recommend you know if you're trying to sell this to try to split things out between. Here's what you get with page extensions, and yeah, yeah. don't because page extensions is a major. I mean, I feel like you're being too casual about it. it, it it's a it's a big deal. I ran into it head on when I tried to add a counter to a struct page, and everybody else runs into it when they try to add a flag or anything to struct page. So it's a dividing line. The distros aren't going to turn it on. Um, I mean, that's my prediction. Uh, you may turn it on when you're debugging, and that mm -hmm. makes sense. But that uh, that's I kind of the. I thought the whole point of PageX, though, was to make things that be boot parameters. Yeah, but in practice, it turns out to be, oh, OK, if you want a high performance production kernel, you leave PageX. You just don't off. want it on at all? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, that's what everyone does. Well, that's, that's a shame. 
you said earlier, which is really important, is you want this to be available for somebody you're talking to on IRC, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody has some random problem, and you want to say, hey, throw this command line on, you're running kernel with your problem that you're hitting right now, and giving this debug data. If you're using PageX, they didn't they didn't do it at boot time, probably. You've got to wait for them to go through a reboot cycle. And then you're back into the debugging world. Yeah. So it doesn't buy you anything at that point. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Vostimil and I'm one of the slab maintainers, but the one with the Git tree, so that makes me more powerful now. And uh, uh, and actually, uh, when we were uh, drafting the call for papers or talks, Matthew put their bullet that one of the topics could be do we really need so many slab allocators? And I thought, oh, that's a good idea for a talk. So I took that one up and this is the result. And uh, actually I thought it would be a nice idea to start with uh, how, how exactly we got here. And then we, should, we can uh, debate what we can do in the future. So for that, I... Uh, even duck the history, historical git tree and uh, checked when the various files appeared. And I hope my uh, my information is accurate. I'm, I wasn't involved in Linux back in those days. So if anyone here was, you can correct me. And if this uh, historical excursion brings you any bad memories, then I'm sorry. So the first kind of small object allocator I found was libmailoxy in very early days or months of Linux. And uh, actually the commit in the historic git tree, which I don't know who wrote, mentioned this command that it was really horrible because, because the size were not stored with the object, so the free had to pass the size as well to free it. So there was some free as function that had to take both the address and the size. And apparently it was years of pain. If anyone here remembers that. Then uh, in 1993, there was a re-implementation in KMLXE, which had the size prepended as now the slope allocator does. And Probably it took still some years to get rid of the free S. And then in 1997, we had the first real slab allocator. That means it allocates classes of objects and not just uh, anonymously sized pieces of memory. And uh, the first users were actually from the memory management itself, the VM area struct, and from the networking SOC struct. And uh, it provided the wrappers for kmalloc, which were not initially used, so still using the other allocators, but a few months that, that the old one was deleted and slab started providing the kmalloc caches as it, as it does uh, until today. And there was some further evolution of the slab allocator. So we had some cleanups, the per CPU arrays for better performance, uh, NUMA awareness, and you can already recognize some 
names that are uh, they are still active and uh, and in 2006 uh, we got another allocator because there was some effort towards the tiny Linux for small devices. I think up to 60 megabytes of memory where the slab, uh, the one with A was the, wasn't sufficient enough because it separates uh, different objects into different pages, which is good for performance, but it's not the smallest memory footprint that you can get so for these tiny devices the slope was introduced which again very similar to the original allocator which just puts everything together and performance is not the main goal mm -hmm. and then in 2007 we got slop with you i i still don't know today how to pronounce this slap and slap so it's uh, immediately obvious which is which so i'm going to say the one with u or a and uh, for the u slap uh, the one of the motivation was that there was too much complexity in the existing slap uh, with a and uh, Compare them today, I would say that the u slab is more complex. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting in retrospect, but but it is more complex for good reasons, I would say, because it really has uh, more features. So uh, and better performance. And other motivation was that uh, Christoph Lameter didn't like the their CPU paired node and alien caches of the existing A slab, and instead uh, did uh, per CPU slabs. The, the slab pages are uh, assigned to a CPU to do the per CPU caching, which is great for allocating, but because you just use the slab available to the CPU, but it doesn't always. Uh, work great when you are freeing objects because if they are allocated from a different slab it doesn't help you that you have some on your cpu exclusively you still have to work with the, 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 the slab page where the object belongs to so, so it's not a complete win that that there is no there are no per cpu use or caches yeah, and other features or advantages is that at the time it didn't have separate um, you know, structure for, for the slot page itself. It used, it, it used the fields of struct page, which then the A slab also was later converted to use. And of course, there are the great debugging features that can be enabled on boot without recompiling. At the time, uh, in the commit log, there was said that there were no on-demand DMA malloc caches, which I suppose was later uh, re-evaluated because there are now there, regardless of uh, whether you use the A slab or U slab. So, and uh, that was in 2007, in July, and already in October, the Uslab was made the default in the kconfig. This great uh, commit log saying, oh, I've heard that some people think it's already default, but it's not, so let's make it default. And that was it. And I actually even didn't find uh, uh, this message on, on the, the lore archive. So it's it might have been sent off list and merged by Andrew without anyone knowing. <laughs> so that's how we uh, were uh, setting the default allocators in 2007. But it seems like some people were really unhappy about it and 
there were more years of discussions that focused on the detail I already mentioned that the USLAP is great for many things, but for some workloads, uh, the, the lock of the per CPU cache for freeing can really make a difference. So it's not a universal thing. So there were attempts to combine the best uh, features of both allocators in one way or another. So for example, Nick Pigging uh, was proposing uh, allocator that was called SLQB, which combined uh, both in some, some uh, specific way and edit edit for for example the uh, per cpu cache for free and what i gathered from uh, the archives is that it wasn't merged because linux didn't want yet another slab allocator because there were already three and th this one would be fourth and you all know the uh, xkcd comics about how a new standard is going to replace all of the previous ones because it's better so because and then it was probably discontinued then uh, actually christoph lameter tried himself to improve the use slab in a way that that makes it uh, best even for the specific use cases in networking and this had several iterations where it was called sleb or S plus Q, and uh, there was this advantage that it wasn't another new allocator, but an evolution of the SLUB, which would probably make it uh, okay. But uh, unfortunately, there were some performance regressions reported, and then and then suddenly the development didn't continue. Uh, so probably got busy with other things. But anyway, the, the, some advantages of SLUB were, were reported to ASLAB over time, like the use of struct page fields and the merging of KMM caches with, of same size and attributes. So they got a bit closer in, in the features, but not completely. So, so that brings us today. We still have these three allocators where the A slab is still the same one with some minor, uh, minor improvements. And everybody knows that if they want to do debugging of pub allocations, they wouldn't use that. And it doesn't make sense to and did there as well. Then for the small systems, we have the SLOB, even though we haven't heard about the tiny Linux effort for some years. I'm not sure if anyone still uh, uses it anywhere. I've checked, the, for example, the open VRT for, for the routers it uses the SLUB loop because the routers have 128 megabytes memory these days at least, and it's uh, sufficient, so. And yes, the SLUB is the, still the default, and uh, overall the best uh, performance uh, with some exceptions. So of course, there's this disadvantage of having multiple implementations because I think we've heard it in even in the MGLRU talk that they have planned to implement some new feature and have to touch all of these allocators. Uh, for the KMLOC and the user facing layers, we need some unified layer that that also has more than thousand lines there, and there was some recent effort to uh, even improve it. Uh, then we have some features that are compatible with only some of the 
some of the allocators like MC, MCG or Nissan K fans. And even then, it was more work to hook, uh, hook it into both of them. And preempt RT is only for uh, the use lab currently. It doesn't make sense to implement uh, the necessary changes for the ACE lab as well. And another issue is, is that uh, multiple allocators block some useful improvements. So for example, from the XFS uh, developers, there, there was a request whether K3 could work not only on KMalloc objects, but also on objects from KMM cache alloc because they might uh, some unified freeing function that wouldn't have to care. And it would be really easy for the ASLAB and USLAB because, because uh, the KMalloc caches are same as any other cache. So the K3 always can uh, look up the right cache and free, free the object, even though it was allocated by KMM cache alloc from a specific cache or from KMalloc from one of the generic caches. But for the O slot, that's an issue because, because uh, K3 doesn't have the size parameter, sorry. I just want to say, um, it, it also helped for RCU because right now you can't call, you have to have a special wrapper to call KMEM cache free because you've got to pass in two pointers, whereas RCU only has space for a single pointer. But yeah, that's also kind of what I was going to ask about. What is the what is the challenge with K3 and KMEM cache um, alloc? Maybe I missed that. The challenge. Yeah, why didn't it work? The, the challenge is in slope because uh, when, when you slope puts everything together, the objects you allocate from specific caches and the KMEM caches. But when you are freeing with KMM cache free, you pass the cache pointer, and from that it can derive the size of the object that's supposed to be freed. But for KMalloc, uh, or if you call K free, you just gave it the pointer to the object. So for those, it has to prepend a header with the size, so it knows how much is there to be freed. And now, if we allowed doing K free on objects that are from KMM cache alloc. That means they can sometimes be freed without passing the cache pointer. So now it would have to store the size for all objects. And that goes against the idea that it should be very uh, memory saving. And it's even worse because of the alignment, EMA uh, alignment, uh, guarantees that we have to provide. When we tried it, it uh, really increased the size a lot. So that brings us to the question, if we can drop one of those allocators to, to have less uh, maintenance burden and uh, and avoid these issues with the K3. And of course, nobody today is suggesting that we would drop the U slot uh, because really the best default. So one question is if we can drop the A slab. There were some past attempts that always uh, ended up by mostly David Rientes or Google guys that they use it internally, the ACE lab, because uh, on their workload, high speed performance, uh, the lack of the peer CPU cache really makes it slower. Uh, so, hey, could so, they uh, share more information about why, why it was performing less? Maybe we could fix the performance issue for those few test cases or what, whatever they use it for. Yeah, um, I think the, he shared at some point that it was the net perf uh, test and 
it was due to the lack of the per CPU array for freeing. Because when you allocate on one CPU and you are freeing the object on another CPU, it's costly. Yeah, this, this actually used to be a performance problem for Oracle uh, back when, um, when I was looking at TPC, when I was still working at Intel, doing work for Oracle um, on, on, on the TPC benchmarks, uh, we, we, we would see this problem. And, and we had similar results to Google, and, and this was exactly it, that the, the networking was allocating one core and then creating on another. And I should mention that uh, at the 2019 thread, I was one of those that say we still are using the ACE lab because we did at that point at SUSE, but since then we switched uh, uh, switched to the use lab uh, as well because Mel Gorman some uh, benchmarking going that showed that it wasn't uh, there wasn't any large blocker and the benefits of the debugging uh, were really useful to us. So I guess if if we want to drop slab, we can try to raise it again and, as you said, uh, ask for very specific details on what's the issue and uh, if if it can be helped with adding some of resurrecting one of the ideas of adding the per CPU cache. So but it what? really isn't worth to have whole implementation just for the corner case. So one thing here, uh, so many other subsystems like IOU ring and even networking now start having, uh, like creating their own cache in front of slab allocator. So it might be like that, again, first question is like, uh, what should we do about that, uh, the slab? And the second is more on the, like the performance issue might have been resolved. I think they might have to just like rerun those things, uh, uh, this TCP or the networking. But I, I think more on the the previous one I have like for the from the slab uh, allocated maintainer, because the other subsystems kind of bypassing or like creating their own caches. Uh, so do, do you mean uh, mempools or literally writing your? Uh, so uh, IO ring has per CPU cache for its specific objects. Similarly, the SKBs uh, and SKB head uh, in the networking have their own per CPU cache. So, yeah. So maybe it would be worth to generalize this and make it part of the allocator and yeah. maybe opt in so it's not for all caches because for others it would be a waste of memory. Yeah, I kind of want one myself. That's why I'm asking, and, and it sounds like we're all having the same sort of issue. I don't really feel like uh, the right place to be doing this is outside the, the slab or slab allocator. The slab fast, the allocation fast path is really fast. It's a slick piece of work. Uh, it's just a, a non-lock double word pump exchange. It doesn't disable preemption or anything. Uh, it sounds like maybe the issue is in the, the, the freeing path using this per CPU free list, but maybe we could make it configurable like per KMEM cache, whether we did a fast path that was suitable for say IOU ring so that we weren't duplicating this over, all over the place. Yeah, right. Well, so my problem specifically is, is that I, I can't fail certain times and I don't know how many things I need uh, well, I, I so I calculate them and then I have to pre-allocate before I call. Whereas I, if if I had something, yeah, mempools. I've been, I've been looking at that, but I, I don't know if it fully fits for other reasons. So that's why I was wondering about the other options. That, well, so so, so so the I there, there are actually different reasons why different people are doing these pre-allocations and they're doing it outside the slab and it's because they know things that slab doesn't. For example, um, SKBs, they're, they're being mapped to particular devices. And so it's not just a per, um, it's not just per CPU or, or anything, it, it's, it's per DMA device. And so they don't have to go back through the DMA mapping layer each time. And that's not really something, information we want to turn in, give to the slab allocator, because that's a real layering violation. 
I mean, we already have separate Cayman caches. Perhaps we could have a cache per DM device. Actually, hoping to get rid of Cayman. Maybe. I, I, we, we just need to have all the information. We can't just go around saying, oh, everyone's put a layer in front of it. We should we should move all that into the side allocator. It's like, no, you've really got to understand the problem these people yeah. are solving. And I think IO Ewing's probably the same thing with a different DMA device. I think that's what's going with IO Ewing, okay. but I'm not really sure. We should we should go and ask um, yeah. Jens, because yeah. he's actually here. So. Yeah. Hey, it's lunchtime, everyone. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So thanks. I guess this is the end of the MM track. So thanks all for coming and enjoy your lunch.